it is 8.03 and I want to welcome everyone this Monday morning to the Michigan Opioid Collaborative's Introduction to Treating Patients with Buprenorphine training today. Um, we are very excited that you have decided to spend your morning with us um, and learn all about buprenorphine and what it means and what it is. Um, just a few housekeeping items. We would love for this to be as interactive as possible, but just please keep yourself muted um, during the um, speaker and um, you can use the raise hand function or enter your question in the chat and we will help moderate to um, get all of those questions answered. We'll also have time for a Q&A um, kind of in between each section. Um, and so we're happy to address any questions and we um, we would love for this to be, again, as interactive as possible. It does make our morning um, go a little bit quicker. At least that's what it seems. Um, before we get started this morning, I would love to just give a brief overview of the Michigan Opioid Collaborative. Um, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is an interdisciplinary team that supports providers and communities to increase access to office-based addiction treatment, expand care, and improve quality of care with patients in opioid and other substance use disorders throughout Michigan. MOC is grant funded through Blue Cross Blue Shield and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We offer free same-day consultation services to help provide evidence-based quality addiction treatment. Our team of specialists are available to help with patient case questions related to treatment and management of substance use disorders. MOC offers quarterly introduction to BUP trainings as we're all here today, as well as webinars on a variety of educational topics, such as addiction, stigma, and substance use topics. We have a hepatologist on our team who offers hep C treatment consultations within 48 hours. She facilitates a biweekly case consultation webinar to review cases with providers and has developed a three-part webinar series on HCV treatment. Um, we also have created some toolkits for providers that are all on our website, which we'll throw our website in the, um, in the chat for folks to check out. And we hope that that will provide a great resource um, when treating patients with multiple SUDs. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative has behavior health consultants around the state that are happy to facilitate trainings, answer questions, troubleshoot with technical assistance, and be an extra support for your organization and your community. Take a look at our website. Again, we'll throw that um, in the chat here in a moment. And my name is Megan Collette, and I am the Behavioral Health Consultant for the Western Region of Michigan. Um, and I'm just grateful to be here with the, all of you today um, and hope that this can be an informative and um, interesting webinar and training series for everyone. We will be sending out the um, PowerPoint that you are going to be seeing today. Um, and so if you'll please um, just put your name, your email, and your location um, in the chat, we'll make sure to, um, to have you here for attendance and also be able to send all the materials um, that, we, that we have um, at the end. And we would love to um, just make sure we have all that information for you. Um, in order to um, kind of hang out with us here at MOC. Um, we we want um, to just introduce some other things that we do with the buprenorphine trainings. Um, the technical assistance for clinic setup. So if your clinic is interested in starting um, this, we can help um, kind of navigate some of those challenges. And we also offer our same day consultation services to providers um, to talk with one of our consulting physicians on the MOC team. Um, and for our communities, we have the behavioral health consultants um, stationed around um, the state of Michigan. Um, and we we just try to build community connections, um, connect providers with other agencies in their in their area. Um, and we also continue to offer our free webinars and other trainings. Um, some do carry those free CEUs. So um, we try to do like around lunch um, typically. And we'd love for you or your colleagues, your friends, your neighbors to join us. Um, at any of those, and you can check us out on the website. To join us for our free consultation services for providers, it's super easy um, and actually can actually be done all through our website. Um, there's an MOC sign up, um, and the provider would then complete that, um, send it in to us. 
And then once a question arises or um, an issue is has developed, um, we'd love to hear from you. You'll contact your local BHC, and then we'll make sure that um, our consulting physicians are available um, to give you a call back or an email back, text, whatever is most um, most easy for for the provider um, to get back with you within the same day or at your convenience. Here's just our quick map. This is also on our website. So you'll see we have our six behavioral health consultants. Um, again, my name is Megan Collette. I am the Western Michigan um, behavioral health consultant. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Melissa DeMars. She is the Upper Peninsula behavioral health consultant. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce today um, our two consulting physicians that will be with us on our training, Dr. Shiva Sethi and Dr. Jonathan Morrow are with us um, today. So you'll be hearing from them. I'll let them introduce themselves um, once they get going. Um, and this is our wonderful team of, of physicians that help provide our consultation services and other questions and answers and facilitate webinars and trainings as well. Again, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is funded by Blue Cross. Um, and MDHHS. Um, and we are just very excited that you're here today. Um, and we want to um, we want to be as interactive as as possible. Um, we're very grateful for you to spend your your Monday morning here here with us. Um, and with that, um, Dr. Sethi, I, I'll turn it over um, to you and Dr. Morrow um, and we'll we'll get the morning rolling. There we go. Okay. I think we got it. I think we got it. Thank you, Megan. Good Absolutely. morning, everyone. My name is Shiva Sethi. I am trained as an internist, and I'm also board certified in addiction medicine through the practice pathway. Um, and Dr. John Morrow and I are excited to talk to you about getting started with treating buprenorphine. We're going to be focusing mostly on an outpatient setting, but I don't know who's here with us. So if you have other questions, please, like Megan said, put them in the chat, unmute yourself. We'd love for this to be as interactive as possible. So I'm just going to give a very brief inter introduction, and then these are the topics that we're going to be covering um, in four hours. So it's going to be, we're going to be um, moving fast. But again, please, please interrupt us if you have any questions. And so um, there's been um, in this past six, seven months or so, several regulatory changes when it comes to prescribing controlled substances and particularly buprenorphine. So at the end of the year, in some end of the year reg um, legislation, uh, the X waiver was eliminated. And so the X waiver was a waiver that the DEA issued that allowed you to prescribe buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder. And so I'm sure all of those, uh, all of us who had DEA numbers received our new, uh, and who had X waivers received our new DEA number cards without the, the X waiver on it. This was the result of years of um, advocacy by many groups who felt that this number further, or this license further stigmatized buprenorphine. Um, so now everyone who has a regular um, DEA license can prescribe buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is scheduled as a, as a Schedule Three substance, so as long as your license covers that, you can prescribe it. In terms of other regulatory changes, um, with the with the X waiver, we had been required to keep track of how many active buprenorphine prescriptions um, for opioid use disorder that we that we had, um, and there were federal limits. Um, on how many uh, patient active prescriptions we could have at the moment. Um, and so you had to apply to, to you know, um, have more patients, but that also was eliminated um, on the federal level. Um, and in terms of the state licensing, actually on June 26th, so just a few weeks ago, um, the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, or LARA, announced that they are also eliminating any licensing requirements they have for buprenorphine or naltrexone treatment in outpatient settings. Um, so excluding um, OTP or, or methadone programs, 
those still have their own separate licensing, but in terms of prescribing buprenorphine or naltrexone, there are no patient limits and there are no reporting requirements. So that's exciting too. Okay. I just briefly wanted to touch on the MATE Act or the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act as well, because we have received some questions about this. Um, and so this was also um, an act that was in that end of the year legislation. And so now the DEA is requiring all um, licensees, either new license or um, renewal, renewal of your license to complete eight hours of relevant SUD or substance use disorder accredited education before obtaining or renewing your license. And this went into effect a few weeks ago as well. Um, if, if, your, if your DEA license is um, expiring soon, I would just check, uh, we have links on our website, but you can also Google it. There are many exclusions to requiring, to, to meeting this requirement. And there's many different ways to meet the requirement. Um, we offer, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative offers webinars for free that meet this requirement, um, but there are many, many other places that you could get this education as well. So um, that is that. And so just briefly, I know probably everyone on this call has seen some version of this slide probably multiple times, but um, this, this X, uh, the X axis is the year starting from 1999 all the way up to 2021. And our Y axis here is um, national drug involved overdose deaths. Um, and so as we can see, starting in 2016 or so, we really start to see a huge spike in deaths that were from synthetic opioids. Um, in the more recent years, this yellow line uh, is the uh, deaths from psychostimulants, involving psychostimulants. And so that's been creeping up as well. Um, but uh, it, the the that that line of deaths just continues to um, it just continues to go to have a very steep steep upward slope and so I'm so happy you're all here with us today so we can learn better how to take care of the, some of these patients. This is just some Michigan specific data. Um, Michigan, I mean, so. Um, the what color is this? I would say maybe a brownish beige is 2020, blue is 2021, and purple is 2022. And so it does seem like perhaps in 2022 we are trending down. Um, hopefully that trend continues for Michigan. Um, this is an old slide. I did not um eliminate it because I'm going to show you the updated slide on the next page but this is a slide showing Michigan um, overdose deaths from January 2021 to December 2021 and the rates by race and I've always found this slide rather striking um just to see how many more deaths in black Michiganders than there are in white Michiganders and unfortunately as you can see with this, this updated slide, um, this disparity just seems to grow. And so I think as we're, we're going through this material today, I think that's really important to keep in mind. I think that's, that's it for my introduction. I had some additional slides on COVID, but I think, um, I think I'm gonna stop here and I'm going to let Dr. Morrow take over and talk to us about neurobiology of addiction. Okay, great. Thanks, Shiva, and, th and thanks everybody for uh, tuning in. Um, so I'm I'm John Morrow. I'm an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan. Um, so I'm a neuroscientist. I have an active neuroscience lab, which is why I'm going to be doing the neurobiology uh, section of this along with some of the other ones. I'm also uh, uh, an addiction psychiatrist, so I've been treating all sorts of addictions through the, um, the University of Michigan's Addiction Treatment Services for, what, uh, probably 15 years now, something like that. Uh, so 
I have experience with with uh, with that as well. Um, so let me share these slides with you. Let's see. Should be able to see it now. Um, wait, am I sharing the right one? I think I'm not. Looks right. Is it oh, okay? Showing up on the wrong screen. Okay. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, neurobiology of addiction. Um, and again, if you have questions, just go ahead and, and um, raise your hand or, or let us know through the chat, or just you can even unmute and, and ask me. Um, so this will be a kind of really, really broad overview, but. Um, the neurobiology of addiction, it, it uh, has to do with reward pathways in the brain. These are, these are pathways that are known to be involved in any kind of reward learning. Um, and decades of research have, have really pointed us in, in this direction um, as the, for the pathophysiology of, of addiction. Um, so what addiction does is it sort of hijacks the normal reward pathways in the brain uh, that are mediated largely by dopamine. So just as a reminder uh, of how this system works, uh, dopamine largely is gonna come from the ventral tegmental area in the brainstem. And then that's those, those neurons project outward to lots of different regions in the brain, uh, including the nucleus accumbens uh, and the frontal cortex, um, which are involved in the in the reward uh, sort of circuitry. Um, so this is the these are the major areas or major pathways that are impacted by drugs of abuse. Uh, and what they're typically what the what the drugs are going to do, what they have in common, they, there's a lot of things that they don't have in common. But the one thing that they have in common is that they will increase dopamine uh, coming from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens. They'll, they'll all do that. Um, and so normally within this circuit, um, that same process happens with any kind of uh, rewarding thing that you, that you would do or encounter, uh, any, any kind of rewarding experience that you would have. What we call natural rewards like food and sex will increase dopamine levels in the accumbens. And these graphs are showing this in rodents that you can, you can put a probe into the nucleus accumbens and pretty directly measure uh, dopamine in real time. Um, and when they, when animals, eat when they, when they encounter food or sex, you see that the dopamine levels increase uh, in response to that, to that stimulus. And the, the normal progression here is that the, the, the animal will reach some goal, usually having some kind of pleasure or satisfaction that's, that they're getting, and that causes a dopamine release. Um, and then what the dopamine seems to be doing in these brain areas is causing a desire to repeat that experience. Whatever experience you just had, if you have dopamine release, you want to do that again. Uh, and you can see why this is useful sort of evolutionarily. Uh, these are things that you need to survive. These are things that, you, um, that, that are good for the organism. And so when you encounter those things, when it's, when it's pleasurable, you get something, uh, something good out of it, you want to do it again. Uh, so that shapes the behavior in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an adaptive way, uh, normally. So with drugs of abuse, they will do something similar. It's not quite the same, but it's very similar. They will also increase dopamine. In the same, oops, in the same region. So these are graphs uh, using the same techniques in rodents when they have encountered 
nicotine, morphine, amphetamine, cocaine, uh, and you see the dopamine in that accumbens goes up pretty sharply. Uh, and it goes up a lot more uh, than it did with, with the natural rewards. Uh, so what's that, what that's gonna translate to is when the animal or person, the same thing happens in people, as far as we can tell, the same things happen in, in people. Um, when you use that drug, you get this increase in dopamine and that will cause a very strong desire to repeat that experience which, you know, that's to use the drug again. Um, but it's important to recognize that this, this, this happens, the, this is the difference between the natural rewards and the, and the drugs of abuse. With drugs of abuse, this happens pharmacologically. It's not, you're not getting this dopamine increase because you reach some goal or you had a pleasurable experience or, um, or anything like that. Uh, you, you're just pharmacologically going to get a release of dopamine when you use this drug. Uh, so that means the drug could cause the worst experience of your life. You're still going to get a dopamine release and you're still going to have a desire to do it again. Um, so that's what leads, partially what leads to the addictive kind of pathological behavior. Uh, now what happens to pleasure is quite different. Uh, it also contributes to the addictive process, but this is a graph of, it's kind of a made up graph, but, th but this is of a uh, pleasurable experience, the hedonic experience that people get with uh, drug use. Um, and what happens is with the first use of the drug, uh, Pleasure goes out, you get into this euphoric state. So you, you get a pleasurable experience from the drug use. And then as the drug wears off, that pleasure wears off as well. And so that you, you crash down into a normal state. And then with, with another drug use, you get that pleasurable experience and that, and that continues. But as you notice, the pleasure gets less and less over time that you're getting from the drug. Same amount of drug, but you're getting tolerant to it. This happens with a lot of effects of, of drugs. Tolerance develops to the pleasurable aspects as it does to lots of other effects, um, like respiratory depression and other, other things like that. Um, and then as the use progresses, you're really getting very little pleasure or euphoria out of the drug use. And more and more what you're experiencing is the withdrawal afterwards you get into this very negative withdrawal state uh, that then uh, then a lot of times you're, you're using the drug just to alleviate that and and become and get into a normal state uh, so the use of the drug is not really to feel pleasure it's just to feel normal uh, at that point um, and uh, but it's important to, to recognize that this process of, of tolerance and withdrawal happens with lots of drugs that are not addictive. Blood pressure medications will go through the same kind of uh, uh, up and down here. Uh, the difference is with, with addiction, there's, a, there's an added component uh, with the dopamine that we'll talk about. But this, this tolerance and withdrawal certainly adds to and contributes to the addictive behavior. People will seek out drugs to avoid withdrawal for sure, but that's not the whole story. Um, and you know that because you can get some, if this was the whole story of addiction, all you would have to do is detox people. You get, you get past the withdrawal state and then why would they ever wanna use drugs again, right? Uh, the problem is that, that that's not the whole story. The rest of the story, um, at least the major part of it is this dopamine response, which does the opposite of withdrawal. So here, again, this is a graph of dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens after drug use. Um, so this, this is in rodents. Again, you can't really do quite this experiment in a human, um, at least not ethically. So uh, you have animals here who were exposed to amphetamine and and there's two groups of animals. So in white, you see the, there's, there's the dopamine response very low. Amphetamine is introduced and the dopamine goes up as we would expect. Uh, 
In black, this group of animals is getting the same dose of amphetamine. Uh, the difference between these two though is, is the ones in white, that was their first exposure to amphetamine. In black, this was their sixth exposure to amphetamine. And you see after the, the dopamine response is stronger and it lasts longer. So you get an increased dopamine response with repeated exposures. And if this was the seventh time, it would be even higher. If it was the 10th time, even higher than that. So uh, this is called a sensitization uh, response. The dopamine response sensitizes over time so that uh, the more drug the animal uses, the more times, the stronger that dopamine response is gonna get which means the stronger the desire to repeat that experience is gonna be. So this is the craving that's increasing every time you use that drug, as opposed to the pleasure, which we just saw is decreasing every time. Uh, so this is why in, in later stages of addiction, I'll have people just in, just in desperation say, I don't understand, why do I keep doing this? It's not even fun anymore. Well, this is why. It's because the pleasure has gone down, they're tolerant to the pleasure, but the, the craving is just going up and up and up. This is all a subconscious process. They don't really have control over this, but this is what's happening in the brain just as a consequence of the drug use. Um, Dr. Yeah. There's a, sure. sorry, there's a question in the chat from Dr. Shante. Will you remind us of a practical example expressed by individuals in your clinical practice of the satisfactions received from dopamine increase? Um, so, well, so, so, this, so this is a good point. The, you don't actually get satisfaction from dopamine increase. The, the dopamine, it's been characterized as a pleasure molecule. Um, I don't know why that's still in the popular literature because it's, it's, it's not true. We've, we've got, I mean, for the last, that was, really in the 80s, we started to understand that that's, that's not what dopamine does. Dopamine release is, it's, it's triggered by pleasure, uh, but it doesn't cause pleasure, it causes desire. Uh, it causes a desire to repeat whatever experience it was. That can be totally divorced from the pleasure. So uh, smoking is a great example of that. Nicotine is arguably the most addictive substance that we know of. It's not like it causes the most intense pleasure. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a direct correlation there. Um, it causes a lot of dopamine release, but it doesn't cause a lot of pleasure. Um, so, so yeah, that's, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if I'm kind of skirting the question there, but, but, but dopamine, it just doesn't cause uh, satisfaction in that way. No, uh, you can't answer, get like, Thank you. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's things like cocaine, which, cause intense pleasure, um, but it's not, uh, that's not necessarily what's driving the addictive process. In that, in that case. Um, they're called non-addictive seeking of the drug, but it's not, it's not addictive yet. So uh, let's see. Where were we? Okay, so next slide, I kind of got off of it, there we go. Um, so, this is, I'll add some more to the neurobiology here. I'm not going to tell you everything, obviously, but um, so we just talked about one of the things that happens in the course of drug use, which is you get an increase in reward drive, uh, kind of coming from the accumbens, the motivational value uh, increases of that drug. You get craving that's mediated by amygdala and other structures. Um, and drug-associated memories get strengthened. This is largely as a result of the, of the actions of dopamine within various parts of the system. So anything that's connected with the drug uh, gets strengthened uh, over the course of drug use. In contrast, there's the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of an area of executive control, inhibitory control, that gets compromised over, over with drug use. So pretty much every drug, drug abuse will reduce functioning in the prefrontal cortex, which is going to impair your ability to control these cravings and, and, and other things that, that the drug is, is engendering. 
So what that, the, the kind of behavioral consequence of that is that in, in normal circumstances, a non-addicted brain, you'll encounter something associated with drug use, like a, like a beer bottle or something like that. That's going to, uh, that's going to trigger memories associated with uh, using that drug. It'll cause some desire to use the drug. It'll cause a drive to use the drug, but it will also trigger um, the prefrontal cortex, which is going to bring all kind of context in there and an inhibitory control. It's going to say, is this appropriate to do right now? Um, and that will override these drives. And it'll say, no, I mean, I like beer, but this is not the time to be drinking beer. Um, and so you won't use the drug. In the addicted brain, the same thing happens, uh, but the drug is the 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 cue is more salient. Uh, it triggers the same sorts of memories. It triggers a drive, but the drive is stronger. There's a stronger desire to drink um, because of the history of drinking, um, and the the control processes are they're less strong and they're less able to. Uh, influence the behavior. The connections are actually, uh, it's like the brake lines are cut. Uh, so ultimately you're gonna use the drug. You just don't have the same level of control over that use. Um, so that, that's what happens in the addicted brain. Um, and I guess real briefly, I'll tell you what happens. If you add stress to the mix here, uh, Stress will increase the dopamine release and sensitize that same circuitry. So, uh, so this is again, this is this is, these are animals. We've seen this graph: animals with uh, measuring dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens in response to cocaine. This time, we got two groups. In gray are animals that are seeing cocaine. Uh, they, they're getting this increase in cocaine. Uh, in blue are animals who are getting the same dose of cocaine. They're, they're seeing it for the first time again. Um, but the difference is in blue, we've stressed these animals out. Not, not a ton, but just like we've uh, made it cold in their cage, or we got them wet, or we tilted their cage a little bit, or we sleep deprived them a little bit. Uh, just messed with them and made it stressful. Um, and you see the dopamine release happens faster. It lasts longer. Um, this is why stress is a major trigger for relapse. It, it, it enhances all of the effects of those triggers on the craving and, and, and reward circuitry. So it, in, it intensifies that desire uh, to use. Uh, so this, this is one reason why aversion therapy doesn't work, where you try to basically punish addiction out of somebody. That increases their stress. I mean, the ultimate effect of that is going to is going to make it harder for them to control their their use under those circumstances. Um, so there are multiple reasons that people uh, use drugs and are, are vulnerable to substance use. Not everybody is going to develop a, an addictive, uh, uh, you know, substance use disorder if they use drugs. Pretty much everybody uses an addictive substance at some point uh, in their life, but uh, there's different factors, some of them genetic, uh, developmental, some of them influenced by the environment, what experiences that person has had, uh, especially early life stress, um, that will make their, their responses to the drug more of an addictive type response. It'll cause more of a dopamine release, It'll, they'll be less able to control those urges, um, and that they'll be more likely to develop a substance use disorder. Um, so, uh, so the, so like I say, there's different factors, um, but with enough exposure to drugs, pretty much anybody can, can develop an addiction. Um, it's just that some people are more susceptible to than others. Uh, okay. And I think, I think we can just stop now. I'll, I'll turn this over to Dr. Sethi for another section. Someone raised their hand. That's exciting. I don't know how to do that on Zoom. I think you could just go ahead and speak if you, is it Dr. Shante? 
Yes, sure. Thank you for answering that first question. I guess my um, what I got out of that, that the dopamine more causes cravings more so than the satisfaction. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. What was my other question? Um, I just wanted to know if someone relapses, looking at that addictive brain, will when they come back just say a year or two will they be at the same threshold possibly of cravings than before they stopped yeah as, so so as far as we know the cravings that that sensitization part uh it doesn't wane very much with with abstinence in fact okay. it will increase uh with abstinence so uh, at least at least to a certain point. So um, so that doesn't seem to be the, the tolerance will be lost. Uh, so a lot of that will will not entirely, but a lot of that will go away. So they may get some more pleasure out of the drug. They may get some more respiratory depression uh, out of the drug. Um, but the 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 cravings. This is why people have to stay in active recovery. Those cravings don't really go away. The brain has really been altered and. Uh, um, in a pretty permanent fashion from the from the addiction use. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And have you, besides the boop, have you um, encountered any other non pharmacological methods that people use to manage cravings besides the medication in your practice? Yeah. I mean, we use the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and that will that that teaches people. So one thing is just to avoid the just to identify what your triggers are and avoid them. So to, so you avoid this whole process. Uh, but another thing is is um, things like telling people to 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 go through pros and cons of using. Just say that out loud. Okay. I want to use or something like that. What that does is it, it engages your prefrontal cortex, which you you have to do that in order to speak in order to use language. So it gets it involved literally in the conversation of whether you're going to use it or not. So that gives okay. it a chance to exercise control. And the more you do that, it's just, you, you exercise it, you can strengthen those, uh, those pathways. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Those are great questions. We're just going to go over some um, basic principles of opioid agonists and antagonists. So um, again, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear them too. Um, uh, okay, so we're going to spend a minute with this graph because it's important. Uh, so on the x-axis we here, we have the dose of the drug. And on the y-axis, we have the percent mu receptor intrinsic activity, or a, a fancy way of saying the drug's effect. <laughs> and so this is a graph of showing um, full opioid agonists, partial opioid agonists, and opioid antagonists. And so the squares, the um, curve all the way to the left, um, this is representing full opioid agonists. So this is all opioid agonists. And, and obviously the slope of this um, line would vary depending on the potency. So this is any, again, any full opioid agonist. So fentanyl, methadone, oxycodone. And so with the full opioid agonist, the more drug you give, the greater effect you get. And this is for all effects of the drug. So this is for euphoria, respiratory depression, constipation. Um, but you know, once you reach the 100%, um, you you level off, and there's a there's a leveling off. Um, if we look at our middle line, the circles, this represents partial opioid agonists. Buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. So it attaches to the opioid, the mu opioid receptor. It actually has a very strong affinity for the receptor, um, but it it does not activate that receptor at 100%. It has a leveling off, probably no more than 50%, and the dose really varies for the person. And so with buprenorphine, for patients who 
um, for patients who already have an established opioid physical dependence, the more drug you give, the more effect you get until there's this leveling off. And so for patients who have, you know, already been, um, who have an opioid use disorder or who have a physical dependence on opioids, this leveling off um, comes before they really start to experience severe respiratory depression. And that's what makes buprenorphine so safe. Um, they, you know, the patient could go home and they could take, you know, 10 films of their buprenorphine, but if they already had an opioid dependence, um, there would be a leveling off and they shouldn't experience respiratory depression if they're not, you know, all using another substance that has respiratory depression properties. Um, now, I will say that if, if you have a patient that does not have a physical dependence on opioids, um, that patient might uh, experience buprenorphine more as a full agonist, and so they, they will be at risk for respiratory depression. And so I'm really only speaking now about our patients who have opioid use disorder or a physical dependence. I will say one, one other thing about this um, ceiling effect. It does seem, although this is somewhat controversial, but I will say the literature is 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 probably points to the fact there's no ceiling effect for pain. And so I have had patients tell me that they buy extra buprenorphine on the street. They don't want to use any illicit full opioid agonists, but they buy extra buprenorphine mostly to treat their pain. Um, and that seems to have, they seem to find more, a great therapeutic value in that. So um there is a ceiling effect. There probably isn't a ceiling effect for the treatment of pain, when buprenorphine treatment of pain. And yeah, then there is a, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. There is a question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to wait till you're done or uh, if you want me to read it to you. Um, let's see. Maybe, maybe I will just, uh, Maybe I'll just go through this last, the antagonist, which is really simple, and then we'll go through the question. Thank you, Melissa. Um, okay, our last line, which is a flat line, these triangles on this graph, um, this is depicting opioid antagonist. So there's naloxone, which is also Narcan, which we give to reverse um, the respiratory depression associated with an opioid overdose. And there's naltrexone, which is um, FDA approved to treat opioid use disorder only in the IM long acting formulation, but it also it's approved for the in the PO formulation to treat alcohol use disorder. These are both um, these are both opioid antagonists, and so they they block the, the drug from reaching the mu receptor. Um, so yes, let's, let's pull up this question. Do you support an abstinence only model given the neurobiology of addiction? Given my experience, varying patients try to continue to use substances at lower dosages and compromise. Oh, that is a, I think a complicated question. Um, I guess I, 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 I would ask what you mean by abstinence only. Um, I think, and we're going to touch on this at various points throughout our presentation, but there is, there are some people in the community or even some of my patients who come to me and tell me that they feel like when they're taking buprenorphine or they're taking methadone, they um, are not abstinent. And so, I would disagree with that with that assessment, um, but um, I think that is a commonly held belief in the community still. Unfortunately, I don't know if that answers. Can I? Can I? Can I uh, yes, give, give my opinion back tomorrow. So, so I would say, as a as a general rule. Well, actually, as a general rule in, in addiction in general, treating addiction is that you should not have general rules <laughs> because it really should be individualized to the patient. And so 
for there's actually there's a lot of people who can do that who can who can use moderately even if they have a substance use to they can get to a point where they can use moderately they usually don't have a severe addiction that's a, that's an indication that their addiction is not that severe if they can moderate like that but there's a lot of people who who cannot do that <laughs> So what I'll do if, if they insist on this kind of moderation, give it a try, see how it works. Let's assess how that's going. Um, if you can't do that, then maybe we should move towards an abstinence uh, model for you. Um, so, so that's what I would say. That, that's different from using, as, as Dr. Sethi was talking about, using a medication like buprenorphine to treat your addiction. That's not addictive use. I would consider that abstinence. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my general response. I love that response. And I feel like also we see that with other conditions, you know, how many patients come in who've been on and who have depression and have been on an SSRI for a long time and want to try and taper off or my patients with hypertension who feel like, you know, maybe they can try without their amlodipine because they've been on it for a few years. So um, I feel like we definitely see that. Um, but yes, I, I agree. Always individualized, individualized treatment. That was any other questions. All right. Um, could we have more explanation of uh, respiratory depression? Sure. When you, uh, what do you mean? Well, you use it in the example. So what is actually happening to the person? So um, opioids affect your respiratory drive. They slow it down dramatically. But um, other, other drugs, um, other, you know, other CNS depressants do as well. Alcohol can, um, benzodiazepines can. And so really when we see patients who have a quote unquote drug overdose, the vast majority of time, we're seeing patients who are using multiple substances. Um, and they're usually, not always, but usually substances that um, have some CNS depression. And so, um, again, if someone is using heroin or fentanyl, they're, they're, um, they're, they're, and they get, you know, they get high, their respiratory, their respiratory rate is decreased. If they're also using benzodiazepines, that will also decrease your respiratory rate. And that's usually when we see, um, that's, that's, that's oftentimes when we see patients have overdoses. Buprenorphine is different um, in the sense that it has this, this leveling off, this ceiling effect. And the ceiling effect usually for, for patients who are, who are opioid dependent is um, we see that before they have um, significant respiratory depression, clinically significant respiratory depression. Um, and so it's 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 much it's a much safer drug, um, especially when we think about our three FDA approved treatments for opioid use disorder. It's methadone, which is a full agonist, buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, and extended release naltrexone, which is an antagonist. Um, buprenorphine and naltrexone do not cause any respiratory depression. Um, so if a patient, you know, uh, starts using fentanyl again, that patient will be much safer than a patient, let's say, who is on a full dose of methadone who's starting to use again, because that patient would be at much higher risk for respiratory depression, both from the methadone and from the fentanyl. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay. So buprenorphine is a semi-synthetic opioid and it's schedule three. So that means that you can give up to five refills. I usually don't, I don't think I've ever, maybe once I had one patient that I inherited from one of my colleagues that, that got several refills, but um, oftentimes I'm seeing, I'm seeing my patients with opioid use disorder frequently, even those who have been um, on buprenorphine for several years. Um, 
It's excreted into the biliary tract, but small fractions enter the urine, and that's how we can do urine toxicology to test for the for buprenorphine. Um, and it's 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 most commonly administered sublingually, um, with a first pass metabolism and bioavailability around thirty percent. It is not absorbed orally, so the patient has to administer it either sublingually or buccally if in the films or tablets. Otherwise, they will not be um, having any active form of the drug. So I mentioned this earlier, but buprenorphine has a very high affinity for the mu opioid receptor. And the mu, there's, there's a couple of different types of opioid receptors, but the mu opioid receptor is where we see most of our clinically significant um, effects. Because buprenorphine's receptor affinity is so high, it can, it can push off the full opioid agonists. It can displace them. Um, and so this is important uh, when we think about how we can start patients on buprenorphine. If you have a patient who is getting a prescription of oxycodone or is using illicit fentanyl on the street, their mu opioid receptors are occupied already with a full opioid agonist. And buprenorphine, because of its high receptor affinity, will displace those other drugs. And so just to, to, to step back for a minute, um, I'm sure many of you have already seen this and know this, but these are some signs and symptoms of opioid withdrawal, acute opioid withdrawal. Um, so it starts with some cravings and anxiety, um, and then it progresses. We see yawning, we see sweating, we see runny nose or runny eyes, um, dilated pupils, um, piloerection or goosebumps, muscle cramps, and then GI symptoms, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You can, there's something called a clinical opioid withdrawal scale. Um, you can Google it and pull it up that way, but you can assign a score to to several of these opioids um, withdrawal symptoms and come up with a, a final tally that will basically help you grade if a patient's in mild, moderate, or severe opioid withdrawal. And so when we think about starting a patient on buprenorphine, um, if so if we have our patient, again, who's on who's taking illicit heroin or fentanyl or you know getting a prescription of oxycodone taking oxycodone several times a day if we just switch that patient to from from their full opioid agonist onto buprenorphine they're going to experience this acute um drop in their um receptor occupancy and they will experience that as an acute opioid withdrawal because buprenorphine will displace all the, will displace a portion of the full opioid agonist off the mu receptor. This, um, this is very, very uncomfortable for your patients. Uh, if, if you have a patient who's taken buprenorphine from the street, talk to them about it, ask them about it. Many of, many of my patients have experienced this um, and it's horrible. It, um, so if you if you talk to your patients about it, I think that they will work with you because and you will work with them because no one no one if they've had this happen, they don't ever want to have it happen again. It's very, very uncomfortable for them. And so in the next section, we'll talk about how we start patients on buprenorphine um, to avoid avoid this from happening. Just a few other basic um for uh, basic principles about buprenorphine. So buprenorphine is, I, when I say buprenorphine, I'm either referring, I'm referring to buprenorphine, but the addiction formulations of buprenorphine are most commonly uh, a combination product, which also in, includes naloxone. And that's, that's most commonly known under the brand name Suboxone. Um, um, this this needs to be taken sublingually or or buccally in order for the buprenorphine to be active. So if it's taken that way, the naloxone is really not absorbed and it's minimally active. 
If the medication is taken PO, if it's swallowed, neither the buprenorphine nor the naloxone is active. If it's crushed and injected or snorted, the, both products are active, the buprenorphine as well as the naloxone, but the naloxone um, is only active for 20 minutes or so. So it's, it's supposed to attenuate any sort of rush and make it sort of a deterrent to misusing it. Um, and just another aside, the, the, these tablets or films are not time release, so they can be split. And in Michigan, you can write for a patient to have a, even a half tablet or film. So you can write someone's doses, you know, one and a half films um, daily sublingually. That's not the case in every state. Some states will not accept that in the prescription, but in Michigan, you can. And just quickly, these are some of the formulations. There was a new um, a sub Q formulation approved a few weeks ago as well. And it's going to be either um, given for a week or given for four weeks, but I don't have much more information about that. But if we look at the at the second part, the second half of this slide, the buprenorphine naloxone formulations, you can either prescribe it as generic tablets, um, you can, or you can prescribe it as the suboxone, which it's most commonly known, which is a film. Um, there's two other formulations here, Bunavil and Zubzol. Bunavil is supposed to be a quicker really uh, quicker dissolving. I've only prescribed it a few times and my patients told me it was equally disgusting. So um, these all, all taste disgusting. The Suboxone is, has an orange flavor and I, you will hear the patients complain about it um, very frequently. And then the last formulation here is the Zubzol, which is a mint flavor, which um, Michigan Medicaid will cover if the patients have, have sort of quote unquote failed these other formulations. The Zubzol, I've gotten some feedback, although I don't have many patients that take it, that it's 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 still disgusting, but it's less disgusting than the Suboxone. So if you have a patient who really can't tolerate the taste, um, you could try Zubzol. Another thing I do if they can't tolerate the taste is I have them, you know, take the Suboxone with a mint or some candy, and sometimes that's um, sometimes we have some success with that. And, you know, I, I'm going to update this slide. This maintenance dose is just a suggested maintenance dose. Um, many patients will be on a higher or a lower dose. And just there's different bioavailability for the different formulations of this combination bup buprenorphine naloxone product. So, um, you know, 8-2 uh, eight, eight milligrams of Suboxone is equivalent to 5.7-1.4 milligrams of the Zubzolv. And so that can be very confusing. So just that's another thing to keep in mind. It's confusing for me, but maybe it's... And then here's just a, um, a brief... Uh... <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there is an extended release formulation of buprenorphine called Sublocade. So just that's also... Um, an, an important option for our patients to keep in mind. So what are some side effects of opioids? What's some side effects of buprenorphine? Buprenorphine is an opioid. It's a partial opioid, but it still is an opioid. So it will have the same side effects as other opioids. So there's constipation. There's minimal um, constipation or GI side effects. Minimal tolerance really develops to these, these um these effects. So if your patient is having constipation early on in their buprenorphine treatment, you want to get them on a good bowel regimen. Um, and we can talk more about that later. There's, um, and then also gastroparesis, nausea. Sometimes the patients will say that they're just not very hungry. Um, and that's when, when I hear that, I, you know, I try and reduce their dose um, if they can tolerate that. Headaches. These these are um, re, these are like rebound headaches. So uh, um, usually the patients complain about them about twenty minutes after they um, dose their suboxone or their buprenorphine. Um, I I usually try and reduce the dose, or if they have a um, history of migraines, I could try um, a 
uh, a headache or migraine prophylactic medication, but you do see that. All opioids cause dry mouth. Um, so that, that causes an increased risk of dental caries. So it just, you know, all patients on buprenorphine just want to try and get them to increase their water intake. There's some theor theoretical risk of decreased bone health due to decreased osteoclast activity. I have not seen any suggestions on, um, on osteoporosis screening, but if your patient does have other risk factors, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, all opioids cause central sleep apnea. This is uh, this is diff this is uh, this is um, this is caused by the effect on the respiratory drive in the in the brainstem, and so this this uh, can appear differently than obstructive sleep apnea because the patients can really have very, very long periods when they're sleeping where they don't breathe. Um, the longest I've seen is, is 30 seconds. Um, so uh, these patients do not snore because there's no obstruction. They just have these very long pauses in their breathing at night. So if your patient is, you know, if they're, if they're scoring high on their upward sleepiness scale, or you have concerns about sleep apnea, um, this this central sleep apnea needs to be diagnosed with an in-house polysomnogram. Um, it cannot be diagnosed with the home sleep sleep tests, um, and and there's a different treatment for it. They don't just use the CPAP. Um, so uh, if you have concerns about this, I would refer your patient to um, sleep medicine. I also have not found great estimates in the literature on the frequency that we see central sleep apnea with opioids. It's, it's really, you know, most of the studies are done on patients on full opioid agonists, and there's really a lot of variability in the um, estimated prevalence. But I would say if you are worried about your patient's sleep, either insomnia or just very sleepy during the day, I would definitely refer your patient to sleep medicine. There's also um, secondary hypogonadism seen with opioids. It's, it's probably less with buprenorphine, although that's again, it's difficult because there's not, not that many studies. And I think almost all the studies, except for one I've, I've seen, have been on men and, and, and looking at testosterone levels. Um, many patients that are on this opioid agonist therapies do, do take testosterone as well. And so if you're seeing patient complaining of fatigue, then um, that can, I would, you know, if you have a male patient can, complaining of fatigue, I would definitely check their testosterone levels if they've been on buprenorphine. For, for females, this often can present as um, amenorrhea. And so just talking to them about their uh, pregnancy risk, I think is, is important. Urinary hesitancy. I, you know, we see this a lot when patients are starting on buprenorphine, they'll come in and the men, um, when you, when I ask them, will say that they have trouble initiating their urine scream. The women will come in sometimes and say that they think they have a UTI and will do a urine dip and it's bland. And so um, just what I usually do, especially if the patient is early in treatment and we're tr still trying to figure out their right dose and they're struggling with cravings, is I have them increase their water intake and I monitor this. If it doesn't improve in a couple of weeks, then I do try and decrease their buprenorphine dose, but um, oftentimes it does improve. And then um, pinpoint pupils, there's no tolerance developing to that as well. And of note, there's no, um, no reports of clinically significant respiratory depression due to only buprenorphine, just buprenorphine. The patient's just taking buprenorphine um, then we really feel like their respiratory depression risk is minimal. And so why do we, um, why do we treat patients with medic medications for their opioid use disorder, you know, be it buprenorphine, methadone, or naltrexone? We want to prevent overdose and death. We want to reduce their cravings and their withdrawal symptoms. 
We want to block the euphoric effect of other opioids. Um, that's also a really, you know, many patients who take buprenorphine tell me that it really helps them manage their cravings because if they're having cravings for fentanyl, they just, they think that, you know, the, the buprenorphine, Buprenorphine is going to block the effect, so why waste their money? And that can be a really powerful tool for them. Um, we want to restore the normal motivation pathway. It should that should say motivation pathway, as we learned from Dr. Morrow, not reward pathway. Um, and there is evidence that you know um, years into treatment, uh, we. Um, we see this years, sometimes years into treatment with buprenorphine. We want to interrupt their addiction cycle of, uh, you know, looking for a drug, using, and then recovering from the drug use or being in withdrawal, having cravings, and then using again. And then we want to improve the rates of engagement in treatment. So how effective are different treatment pathways for opioid use disorder? So this was a study done in 2020, and it it used um, in insurance databases to look at about 40,000 patients um, who had a new diagnosis of opioid use disorder, and they compared these different treatment modalities to no treatment. So um, outpatient counseling, intensive behavioral health treatment, inpatient detox or residential services, buprenorphine or methadone, um, and naltrexone. And only buprenorphine and methadone were found to have a reduction in overdose and death um, when all these different treatment modalities were looked at over a three-month period. And then also, um, when we look at the number needed to treat in order to, um, the number needed to treat, I can't see my... I have all the notes in my, I have all the details in my notes section and now I can't see it because, but um, so in order to avoid one non-fatal MI, I think for, uh, um, for patients on statins for about five years, we need to treat 104 patients with a statin. For antihypertensives, in order to, uh, to avoid um, a myocardial infarction, we need to treat 100 patients with antihypertensives for five years. For naltrexone, this is this is actually um, data from alcohol use disorder. We need to have 20 patients on naltrexone therapy in order to achieve um, abstinence from alcohol. But for buprenorphine, um, we only need to treat two patients in order to have one patient retained in treatment and one patient have suppression of their opioid use disorder. So this is, uh, you know, both naltrexone and buprenorphine are wildly effective drugs and um, for the treatment of alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder um, respectively. And we should be offering these medications to patients who have opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder. And there are many randomized control studies that back this up. They show buprenorphine is more effective as um, then placebo and equally effective to, to methadone on all these primary outcomes, decreasing illicit opioid use, cravings, um, mortality, improving occupational stability and psychosocial outcomes and retention and treatment. And uh, just a, as an aside, you know, methadone has been approved for treatment of opioid use disorder for more than 50 years. And so many, and buprenorphine was approved for treatment of opioid use disorder in 2003. And so many of the earlier studies do compare buprenorphine to methadone because um, methadone, you know, um, has a much longer um, body of evidence to compare to. And this, this is just a prettier version of the previous slide. But medications are the most effective treatment for opioid use disorder. And without the medication treatment, patients have higher rates of substance use and overdose. I don't know how we're doing on time. Maybe I'll just briefly go over naltrexone too, because I've been mentioning it. It is a treatment, it's, a, it's an FDA approved treatment for alcohol use disorder in PO and IM formulations and opioid use disorder in the IM formulation. 
It's not recommended for use in pregnant patients, um, but it is not also not a controlled substance and many patients will come in seeking this treatment. Um, Patients do need to be that that have been physically dependent on opioids must be opioid free um, for seven to ten days of treatment before before they receive the naltrexone. And if we think back to the first slide in this present in this in this PowerPoint, it's because we don't want them going from a very high mu receptor opioid receptor effect to to zero. Um, that would also cause an acute opioid withdrawal, which would be very uncomfortable for the patients. Um, and I actually, I, I talk to my patients about that. Um, I, sometimes I draw them out that graph. I want them to understand that they should not receive, and you know, many of these patients are receiving a naltrexone injection when they're coming in for opioid use disorder, but I just want them to understand that they, it will have an effect similar to Narcan. Um, so they should not take it. They don't have to tell me that they have opioids in their system, but they should not take the naltrexone if they do. And I've had two patients that tell me in the past that they that they had opioids in their system and they took an IM injection and they both actually had to be hospitalized for several days. And one of them told me that they they started hallucinating. So um, just I think just making sure your patients understand uh, is the most powerful tool we have. Um, and then the, the IM formulation is, is recommended, the, rec the FDA, you know, the package insert recommends dosing every 28 days. However, some patients metabolize it more rapidly. And so I have had patients come in and they say like, you know, around th the three week mark, they, they have a lot of cravings and that I, I had, I have had a couple of patients that for a while would go on oral naltrexone for that last week. But Michigan Medicaid did um, uh, sort of update their drug coverage. So we can dose the IM extended release naltrexone every 21 days for either alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder. And some patients really do prefer that. So patients who come in and they're asking for naltrexone, um, that, that's a good medic, that's it's a good medication for them. Patients who don't want to take dose themselves on a daily medication, that's also a good option for them. Um, patients who have a lot of withdrawal symptoms or cravings, it, it might be, it might not be the best option for them because um, it doesn't have as much of a, it doesn't have an effect on the withdrawal, opioid withdrawal symptoms. And some patients tell me it helps their cravings and other patients don't. And the, that's really what we see in the literature as well. If your patient has hepatic dysfunction, it's also not a good medication for them because we really don't want to prescribe this medication for patients who have an AST or ALT that are greater than five times the upper limit of normal. And you know, this, this patient population um, has high rates of hepatitis C. So sometimes you do see that. So I do always try and check their labs before we initiate it. Um, it's generally well tolerated, it, um, especially when it's taken PO, it can cause some GI side effects or like a flu-like symptom, symptom, symptoms. So I usually start patients on half a tablet for a couple of days and tell them to take it with food before I increase it to the full 50 milligrams. When it's dosed IM, um, it's, it's very, it's a thick um, substance. So it really needs to be um, pushed very, very slowly. But even, even then, many patients have site, site reactions with the IM injection. So, um, you know, a lot of itchy, itchiness, um, nodules. I've seen nodules persist for several weeks with this too. Um, but yeah, you know, I worked with this MA years ago who would just push it really slowly, like over two minutes. And, um, and and those patients really had no no site reactions, and then it became a problem because if if um, if she wasn't available and they came in, they sometimes would pout and would not want anyone else to dose the medication. And then you know another thing to keep in mind is that you know as as Dr. Morrow mentioned, there is a reduced opioid tolerance when either patients abstain, but also you know with the when they use the naltrexone, and so. If they do start using opioids again, they're at much greater risk. They've lost their tolerance. They're at much greater risk of, of an opioid overdose because they can't use the amount that they were once using. They'll experience respiratory depression at a much lower dose of their opioids. And so I 
I would frequently remind patients of this. I would try and remind them of it every time they came in for their injection um, to the point where they would they would recite it to back to me, which is great. I'm gonna skip this. Um, this is just more information about administering the naltrexone, um, the IM naltrexone. Um, we will we will send everyone the slides so you will have all of this and you can always call us if you have any questions. I'm going to stop there though and see if we have any questions. There's one question. Um, it says, "Can you please provide?" Oh, sorry. Um, the question is: is is there a letter given to clients to share with employers that they're prescribed buprenorphine? I'm wondering how this affects their employability due to stigma. Um, I I have not done this generally um, because I'm not I'm not sure how most employers would know that their patients are prescribed buprenorphine. I guess they could see them dosing their medicines. Um, or I think I think the only area this might come up is if the patient is in some sort of setting where they are regularly drug tested. But I have actually not had this come up. I don't know, Dr. Morrow, if you have. Uh, not not usually. I mean, it's uh, it's just not relevant to the. I mean, that's their personal uh, health information, so they don't have to share that with their employer. I mean, if they want to, they can, but it's it's just not uh, it's not something they need to know most of the time. And even if, even if they're taking it during the day, the letter I'm providing is this person needs to take their medication. It's not what medication it is, not what it's for. So, because the employer just doesn't need to know that. Um, it, and it, with the drug tests, it's not going to show up on most of the forensics uh, drug tests because buprenorphine is structurally very different from from opiates. So unless they're testing specifically for buprenorphine, it's not going to show up on a drug test. And th there's not much reason to test specifically for that just, just on a work screen. So it usually just doesn't come up. OK, I was responding. I thought I saw a slide that said that it shows positive on a drug test for opioids is the reason why I ask. And when people are new hired, oftentimes they have to take a drug Tests and my thoughts is that could, you know, cause people who take you to be screened out of the, you know, the applicant, you know, the new hire process. So for synthetic opioids like buprenorphine or fentanyl, they need to have their own drug assay. They're not going to show up on just a general test for opiates. Um, so if if the person was getting that kind of a drug test where they were testing for synthetic opiates, we could, um, they, they could, uh, I mean, I guess it, 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 maybe even expanding that to all controlled substances. If a patient is taking a stimulant to treat their ADHD or um, are they on a benzodiazepine for anxiety? I mean, I'm sure these, these other instances could come up and if the patient did need a letter, then I would just provide them a letter. Okay, so it does not show up as an opioid on a new hire. It doesn't. Drug test. And, and you know okay. what? We're we're gonna go over um your uh, toxicology a little bit later. But yes, we have a chart that that shows it should it will not show up as a positive opiate. It will show up. You you need to test for it separate separately. Okay, thank you. And then transdermal buprenorphine. Um, the transdermal buprenorphine is the butrans patch, and it's it's only FDA indicated for pain. And we will we will cover that in the in the pain section of the um, of the presentation. But if you have more specific questions, I'm happy to answer them now too. And just maybe real quick. Um, Another reason for using medications to treat opioid use disorder is the brain stabilization, as Dr. Morrow so nicely went over, but um, there's many brain circuits that are overactivated by the presence of opioids. So this medicine helps sort of stabilize that dysfunction and can allow 
those circuits to sort of um, help help be um, in a more normalized way. There's one more question, Shiba. Um, will the DOT allow employees to use buprenorphine? That is a good question, and I do not know the answer to it. I can see, look into it, though. Do you know, Dr. Morrow? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'd be surprised if they don't, but I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Agree. DOT does random tests. Okay, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And Dr. Benson says buprenorphine is not on a DOT drug screen. Okay, thank you. Um, if we don't have more questions, maybe we could try and get through one more section and then we could take a short break. Does that all right with you, Dr. Morrow? Yeah, absolutely, okay. Um, now let me just, here it is properly. Um, you should see you, that's great, okay. All right, so this section we'll talk about uh, buprenorphine, so intake and initiation of buprenorphine for, for new patients. Um, and so the first question you want to ask before you start somebody on buprenorphine or even evaluate them for that is, are you ready to prescribe buprenorphine? Um, and for that, you want to ask, you know, do you have the resources available to provide appropriate treatment for someone who, who needs uh, buprenorphine? Uh, can you provide medical care? Can you provide psychiatric care? Uh, can you refer to that? Uh, do you have places to refer them if they, if they need that, assuming that you can't provide that yourself? Whatever they need, do you have access to that? Um, and you want to think about on-call coverage uh, because people will need their medication. This happens regular. It's happened on Fourth of July when maybe somebody just didn't have access to their medication, um, and they, if they don't have access to their medication, they're going to go into withdrawal and they're going to relapse, probably. So they need to be able to get a hold of somebody uh, in that situation. So how is that going to happen in your um, in your office? Um, are there treatment programs available that will accept a referral for more intensive levels of, of service if needed? If they need inpatient treatment, where are you going to send them? That's that stuff you should figure out before you start um, treating people um, with these disorders. So assuming that you've done that uh, and, you, and you have a satisfactory answer to those, then uh, you want to assess the patient. You can start uh, gathering information on this patient, and this slide shows some of the things that you want to um, that you want to assess on on all of these patients. So, so for one thing, what other drugs? Uh, maybe they, I'm assuming that they're using opioids, but what other drugs are they using? Uh, you want to go through a list, including tobacco use. That's most of the deaths is over 50% of deaths in uh, substance abuse patients are from actually their tobacco use. So that's definitely something that you want to assess. Um, review their prescrip prescription drug monitoring program. That's MAPS uh, in Michigan. Um, that tracks their controlled substances. Hopefully people are aware of that. Um, you want to assess, do they actually have an opioid use disorder? Uh, and also other substance use disorders. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, identify other uh, emotional, behavioral, medical conditions, how those are gonna be addressed, when, where, 
um, that, that all needs to be assessed. You can't just focus on the, on the opioid addiction because they probably have other things going on as well. Um, evaluate their level of impairment or functioning. This is physical, psychological, social. Um, and last but not least, certainly not least, is determine their interest in participating in treatment. Uh, they may need a whole lot of stuff. If they don't want that, uh, you're not going to really be able to impose that on them. So, uh, so you want to assess how, what is they want to do? What are they willing to, to participate in in terms of treatment? Um, all right, so, so this is a card that you could use for taking a, a substance use history. Uh, asking a number of questions, age at first use, pattern of use, how often it needs to be you know, fairly detailed so you get uh, a sense of what actually they're using and, and, and how and all of that kind of things. You wanna go through specific substances, uh, not just do you use drugs? Cause I've certainly had people say no. And then I go through, and, oh, cocaine, oh yeah, well I use it. So, so you wanna go through these individually with people. Um, what, what treatment they've had, and what consequences of their use that can give you a, a, an idea of how uh, impactful it's been on them in terms of legal consequences, social, you know, your marriage, your job, all these kind of things. Um, so we want to assess co-occurring uh, disorders, co-occurring mood disorders and other psychiatric disorders, but certainly mood disorders are very common. Um, 30% of people with mental health disorders also have a substance use disorder. And conversely, if you have someone with a substance use disorder, more than half of them will have another psychiatric disorder. Um, uh, and it's important to note that treat, treating that is important. So major depression uh, increases relapse, worsens, worsens outcome. But, if, but major depression in remission does not worsen outcomes. So it's important to, to identify that and treat that if they have a comorbid psychiatric disorder. Um, you definitely wanna ask about the timeline of, of those symptoms, ask about symptoms during periods of abstinence uh, because the substances can cause a lot of psychiatric symptoms, including mood symptoms, depression and whatnot. So is this a separate disorder? Or is this just a consequence of their use? Very helpful to determine did, were they having these symptoms before they started using? Or if they went to two years or so of abstinence, how were you feeling at that time? Did you have mood symptoms at that time? That can help you with your diagnosis. Uh, family history can also be helpful. You know, if they certainly not going to determine everything, but, uh, you know, if somebody has two or three uh, close family members with bipolar disorder, you're going to be more likely to, to suspect that this person has a bipolar disorder and it's not just uh, consequences of substance use. Um, okay, and so, and also, you know, you, you want to actually diagnose them with, a, with an opioid use disorder. Um, so uh, it's not enough to say that you're using opioids. You want to go through the actual DSM criteria, which are summarized here, um, and determine whether they meet these criteria or not. Um, and, you know, the severity of their addiction will be indicated by, by the number of these things that, that, are, that are positive for them. So two or three is a mild uh, substance use disorder. Six or more is a severe substance use disorder. Um, a couple of these have asterisks here, the, the tolerance and withdrawal. Um, those can't be the only symptoms of, of, of the substance use. Those, those are part of the criteria, but if that's all they have, they don't have an, a substance use disorder. They're just, that's, those are just natural physiological consequences of being on the drug. Uh, but if they're meeting something else as well, then yeah, they would have a substance use disorder. And most, you characterize these as a, it's a loss of control over their use. All of these indicate that they, they are no longer completely in control of their substance use. Um, they may think that they are, <laughs> uh, but they're not, uh, as indicated by all of these different criteria. Uh, 
So also important, you certainly don't want to miss this, is taking a good social history, getting a sense of what this person's life is like, what's their home situation like, where they live, how are they employed, what's their financial situation, do they have kids, do they have other social supports, what's their educational background, legal problem, all of these are going to be important for your treatment plan. Uh, because you, you, you can come up with a great plan uh, for, uh, for somebody that really doesn't match their reality. <laughs> uh, they don't have a home to go to. They don't have people to rely on. You, you have to take that into account when you're making a treatment plan. So you got to ask about these things uh, so that you know. Um, that, well, just as an example, even something like sexual orientation, and um, that could influence, for example, if, if you're sending them to recommending a peer support group, um, maybe a more appropriate peer support group, if, if that's a really big part of their identity, would be a peer support group that's around that identity. If you don't know that that's their sexual orientation or that, that, that's even a part of their life, you may not know where to refer them. Anyway, that's just an example. But, um, so another, another thing important to consider is um, we talked about other substances. One in particular is sedative hypnotics. Uh, this is mainly going to be benzodiazepines we're talking about here, Xanax and Valium and those types of things. Um, so the, the kind of unique thing about those is that they cause some respiratory depression. Uh, buprenorphine also causes some respiratory depression. Uh, buprenorphine is very safe, as, as Dr. Uh, Sethi already mentioned. It's it's uh, it's really basically it's it's impossible to overdose, uh, fatal overdose on buprenorphine alone because of that ceiling effect. But if you combine that with something else that that causes res respiratory depression, you can have a fatal overdose from a combination of buprenorphine and a benzodiazepine, for example. Um, so that's, that means it's a relative contraindication to prescribe buprenorphine to somebody who's, who's on uh, these uh, uh, benzodiazepines. So uh, a lot of times if people have a, a sedative hypnotic use disorder, you're gonna wanna refer them to a higher level of care to get that under control. Um, that's probably going to be beyond your your, your abilities. It's just starting out in this, um, so you're going to want to refer them. But the reality is, they may not want to go. They might they may not agree to go to that uh, higher level of care. So now you're stuck with: Do I prescribe buprenorphine to this person with an opioid use disorder? That's really the only thing they're going to agree to is is a medication. Um, knowing that they could overdose uh, on on their medications that I prescribed uh, in addition to the, to the benzodiazepines that they're taking. Um, but I would also consider there, what's the alternative? If you don't prescribe buprenorphine, this person is probably going to use full agonist, full opioid agonist, heroin, fentanyl, much, much higher risk of overdose when you combine those with, with benzodiazepines than if they're using buprenorphine combined with the benzodiazepine. So the patient is going to be better off if you prescribe them buprenorphine in that situation. That's, a, that's a, something that you should document in your notes, that, that line of thinking, um, and prescribe the buprenorphine, you know, if, if that, because that could save the person's life. So you want to document that and, and go ahead and prescribe. That's the recommendation uh, nowadays. Certainly, educate them about that risk, um, but you ultimately you want to you want to put the patient at lower risk because if you really document your your concerns there, um, you're not going to have trouble, and and this patient is going to be more likely to live. Um, questions about that, or no? I can move on. You can put them in the chat, I guess. If you have questions. Um, okay. So induction, initiation, starting someone on buprenorphine. Uh, the big thing that, that we emphasize here is, is avoiding precipitated withdrawal uh, with, with buprenorphine. Because if you 
if they're on a full agonist, if they're taking heroin, if they're taking fentanyl, and you just start them on buprenorphine, that will reduce the number of receptors that are, that are uh, the, the, the amount of receptor uh, activation very dramatically, it cuts it in half. Um, that causes a lot of withdrawal. So you wanna avoid that. Um, so the way to do that is to have the patient already in some mild to moderate withdrawal. That means they have some unoccupied mu opioid receptors. They're not gonna uh, go into withdrawal um, if you add buprenorphine in that situation. Um, and your goal in, in the induction is titrating the buprenorphine to a dose where they're not having cravings. Uh, they don't have uh, withdrawal symptoms, a very minimal withdrawal symptom, minimal side effects also from the buprenorphine. Okay, so before you start, you wanna review a treatment agreement, consents. You do that start talking form that you need for every um, opioid. Um, and the part of the informed consent is telling them about other treatment options, um, abstinence, methadone, naltrexone. Um, tell them about the physical dependence that you can get on buprenorphine. They already dependent on some other opioid, but uh, you can tell them about this physical dependence and uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, which you can get with any opioid buprenorphine included. Um, you don't need to do labs uh, in order to um, start buprenorphine, but uh, it's it's recommended that you get uh, that you test for these things that are listed here: hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, pregnancy tests. Certainly, these are the things that you would want to know. Um, but uh, and, and you want a uh, urine drug screen as well to see what 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 drugs they may have in their system. But don't. Um, I wouldn't delay starting their uh, buprenorphine because there's some hang up on these tests. It's more important to start the buprenorphine uh, than, than to have these tests. Um, but certainly these, these, are, these are useful things. Um, remember the drug screens aren't always reliable. A lot of drug screens aren't even gonna detect fentanyl. Uh, it's so prevalent now that, that I think most labs are putting that on there. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take that as the gospel truth if you get a urine drug screen. Um, but it's certainly something that you want to get and 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 document. Um, so there's um, we used to do these all in the office, um, but now there's plenty of data that shows that people can start buprenorphine at home. You can give them a prescription for buprenorphine. And they can start it at home on their on their own, not observed or supervised. Um, there's been lots of observational studies supporting that. Um, not a lot of randomized controlled trials, uh, but I'll tell you, since the pandemic, I pretty much always do home inductions. Uh, these are virtual visits that, that I'm having with people, and, and it it goes fine. There's a lot of benefits to it. Patients are usually more comfortable. You don't need a driver, you don't need to schedule. There's less burden on the patient, there's less burden on, on you and your clinic in terms of staffing and whatnot. Um, so there's lots of uh, benefits for um, starting people on a, on a home induction like that. And keep in mind, these are, these are usually ex experienced uh, opioid users. They've been using full agonists. Buprenorphine is much safer than the things that they've already been using. So um, th they usually can handle it if you just explain how buprenorphine works. Uh, okay, so we kind of talked about that, observed versus unobserved. There's a low dose versus high dose initiation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the microdosing. I don't really do the high dose <laughs> uh, macrodosing, but um, so I, I won't really talk about that, but. Uh, there's, this is a, there's a, you'll have these materials. There's a commentary here. Um, that's, uh, it's a good read. Just, just, um, 
emphasizing how uh, important and impactful buprenorphine treatment is um, for patients. So I would I would recommend that to you. Um, all right. So here's the here's the microdosing. So this is a this is a technique of starting buprenorphine that removes some of the barriers for people. Um, basically, this is this is a way of avoiding the withdrawal uh, entirely for people. So one way to do that, as I mentioned, is having them abstain from opioids so that they're already in withdrawal when you start the buprenorphine. That way, you're not going to get a precipitated withdrawal. The other way to do this, you know, so there's some patients who just, they, they can't tolerate that or they won't tolerate that. They're not gonna go through this abstinence period. It's, gonna, it's, a, it's a huge barrier for them starting treatment. It's just, I can't go through withdrawal at all. Um, so one thing you can do is uh, uh, for the methadone is certainly an option for them, but buprenorphine can still be an option for them if you do this kind of microdosing schedule where you start with very, very low dose of buprenorphine and gradually increase that on successive days to a full dose of, of buprenorphine. What that does is gradually replace, and even if the person is still using other opioids, the, the buprenorphine has a higher binding affinity, so it's gonna displace those other opioids and gradually replace them with buprenorphine. Um, so that way you're, you're you'll, be reducing the activity of those opioid receptors, but in a gradual way. So they, they shouldn't get much withdrawal with this type of schedule. Uh, that way you can, even if, they, even if they can't tolerate any abstinence at all, you can still get them started on buprenorphine. Um, now, if they have withdrawal uh, for whatever reason, either because you've, they've stop this uh, as, as part of the opioid withdrawal or whatever, then there are ways that you can treat that without using an opioid and that won't interfere with your buprenorphine induction. And some of these are listed here. Clonidine is a, is a big one that, that treats a lot of the symptoms of withdrawal. Um, that alone will, will decrease their chances of relapse. Um, and then depending on what other symptoms they may be having, you can add other, you can ask them what, what are your withdrawal symptoms. And you can prescribe these other things, NSAIDs for pain, um, insomnia. Well, this says that I usually don't use benzodiazepines for insomnia. I would use like trazodone or something like that. But you, I mean, you can use benzodiazepines. Um, dicyclamine for abdominal clamps that's, that's mental, or uh, loperamide, which is actually um, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a type of opioid, but that will, uh, that will treat diarrhea. It just depends what symptoms they're having. You want to certainly give uh, instructions uh, to the patient, um, very clear instructions on how to how this is going to work, what they should do, what they can expect. Um, so if they're using prescription opioid pills, um, yeah, and I would say this is that they're getting from a doctor. <laughs> Because even the prescription opioid pills, if they're buying that from some other source, they're often that's often fentanyl. They don't really know. So if it's if it's not fentanyl, if you're pretty confident it's not fentanyl that they're taking, they can abstain for 12 to 16 hours and start the initiation because they'll already be in withdrawal, depending on what, what the opioid they're taking. If they're using heroin, which is definitely going to be fentanyl, or if they already know that they're going to that they're using fentanyl needs to be at least 24 hours, often more like 48 or even more before they're really in withdrawal. Um, um, the fentanyl is just very, it's, it's fat soluble, which really extends its life in the body. And so uh, it makes it more difficult to get a, a, a clear withdrawal <laughs> uh, uh, from the fentanyl. Um, so what you can look at is though, is their uh, opioid withdrawal scale is the, the clinician uh, uh, administered and the, and, the, and the patient administered opioid withdrawal scales there. So there's the cutoff scores. If it's, if it's over 12 on the cows or over 17 on the sows, then they're in enough withdrawal to start a buprenorphine. Um, 
Uh, so you want to instruct them on how to take this. It needs to go under the tongue. It's sublingual administration. You can the pharmacist can help them with this as, as well. But it should be clear they need a wet mouth. Um, that's why you don't you don't smoke at least uh, a half hour before dosing the medication so that you get um, lots of circulation in there. You get you have the saliva and it'll be absorbed sublingually. You don't swallow it. If you swallow the medication, it just gets digested and it doesn't do anything. It has to absorb under the tongue. Um, and definitely talk to them about precipitated withdrawal. If they understand what you're talking about, they're gonna do whatever they can do to, to avoid precipitated withdrawal. <laughs> So that first uh, prescription, how much are you going to give them? Typically, I'll give them you know, this three to seven days. I usually will give seven days worth of, of medication to, to the pharmacy. That'll last them to, to the next appointment with me, which is usually going to be a week um, after they start. It depends on the patient, though. Sometimes I'll want to see them earlier if it's really unstable situation. Um, but you want to keep in mind uh, what is their copay? You want to know that. How, you know, how much is this going to cost them? Is it reasonable for them to fill a prescription every few days? So some, for some patients, it's just not reasonable to do that. Um, do they need a prior off? Um, uh, you know, you can co-prescribe naloxone. In fact, um, you should uh, co-prescribe uh, naloxone as a rescue medication for anybody with an opioid use disorder. It, really, anybody who's using illegal substances, even cocaine, gets laced with fentanyl. So, you want to co-prescribe uh, naloxone to those folks. Um, and then for dosing, you want to get to at least sixteen milligrams for almost all your patients. If they're complaining, if they're having uh, side effects, if they're getting too sedated or something, then I'll go less than that. But pretty much everybody, I'm trying to get up to at least 16 milligrams because that's that's the dose that's shown to be effective. Uh, the official package insert, I think, recommends, this is still, I guess it still recommends 12 milligrams. Um, but I'll, I'll just, for most patients, that's going to be inadequate. They should, they should really get up to 16. Some of them will insist on being at two or four or eight that's not adequate. <laughs> if that's all they'll take, then that's fine. But um, but you really want to get up to 16 at least. And uh, 24, uh, it's not uncommon at all for people to need 24 milligrams of buprenorphine a day. Um, usually not more than that, but that, that's it's not uncommon for them to need 24 milligrams. Um, and keep in mind, if you give somebody too much buprenorphine, uh, if they're taking too much buprenorphine, that has no consequence whatsoever. <laughs> uh, it's a partial agonist, so nothing's going to happen if they take more than they need. Um, all right. So here's an example of patient instructions that you can give to people. There's lots of these available online. Um, just want to make sure that the instructions are clear. Um, and the way to do this is to have them take uh, two milligrams, four milligrams, something like that, just to see if they can tolerate the medication, see what effects that has, uh, whether they're getting a precipitated withdrawal. It's a lot better if they have only had two milligrams than if they had 16 all at once, right? So give them that, that initial dose, wait for an hour, um, and then if they're feeling better, then take the rest of it and get up to the, the dose that you're, that you're trying to get them to. And that's whatever dose will treat their symptoms, whatever dose is going to have them not in withdrawal and, and not having a lot of cravings. Um, let's see. So, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, I usually, I'm not going to go beyond 16 milligrams on the first day. If they need more than that, I'll, I'll have them take six, six, up to 16 milligrams that first day. And then the next day, um, we'll take that 16 milligrams and then add on to it if, if necessary. Um, let's see. Yeah, it may take longer for patients on fentanyl to feel better. Uh, so it's not, it's not the, the best guide. Um, sometimes with patients with fentanyl, you may, they may need to just stay on it for a little while before you know the full effects of the buprenorphine on them. Um, 
And yeah, you want to, if they're getting sleepy, if they're getting sedated, that's too much. Just, just back off on the dose at that point. Okay, so uh, if a patient is, so this is a little different situation if a patient is not physically dependent on uh, opioids, meaning um, they've already gone through the whole withdrawal period, they've been abstinent for a while. Sometimes this happens after they've been incarcerated, after they've been hospitalized, something like this. Um, they can still meet op criteria for an opioid use disorder, even a severe opioid use disorder, but you're not concerned about withdrawal. So for that, you can just start them on buprenorphine um, and just titrate that dose to a point where it's controlling their cravings and it's not causing a lot of side effects. Um, you still want to start um, low just in case there's something you don't know <laughs> that's going on and maybe they do get withdrawal. Uh, but you can, you can titrate that up uh, pretty quickly with, uh, with folks who aren't. In, in danger of a precipitate withdrawal. Um, and again, you can rely on the patients to titrate this dose. They know about opioids at this point, so they can, they can titrate that dose pretty well. Uh, so if you do get a precipitated withdrawal, um, I don't want people to be overly nervous about this. It, it, it's, it usually doesn't happen. Um, I can't even think of a patient that I've had go through a, a precipitated withdrawal of counsel people who have done that. Um, but opioid withdrawal in itself is not, um, that's not going to be a cause of death unless the person has some kind of underlying heart condition or something like that. It would be very uncomfortable that they're not going to die from an opioid withdrawal, even a precipitated withdrawal. Um, you. Um, you want to, really it should be managed in, in, in an emergency room. So you can tell people to go to the emergency room to get uh, supportive care for their um, precipitate withdrawal. If they're really having that bad withdrawal, then they should do that. Um, but if you're managing this, there's not, there's not an expert consensus. Um, but what you can, I, I'd say the best way to manage that is just to give them more buprenorphine. Uh, they're in withdrawal. So you load them with more buprenorphine to get all of that, all of their receptors occupied with buprenorphine. That'll get them. Um, uh, that usually is going to get them comfortable if you if you just give them enough buprenorphine to occupy more receptors. Um, the other, you can just stop the initiation. Sometimes patients will insist that you do that. Uh, understandably. Uh, then you can give those uh, medications that I talked about earlier, um, clonidine, uh, bentyl, NSAIDs, to manage the opioid withdrawal symptoms. And what you should do is, is try that again uh, the next day, try the initiation again. The problem with that is this person just went through a really horrible experience with buprenorphine, and there's no way they're going to do that again. <laughs> I mean, they, they should, you can counsel them to do that, but they're not going to do it. So, so you, that's, that's really why you want to avoid this precipitate withdrawal. It's just, you know, um, and to get them on a full dose of buprenorphine, if you can do that, even though they're in the withdrawal, then they've gotten through it. They're on buprenorphine. They're, they're safe. They're much safer than if you had stopped uh, the initiation. And because and, really they're just going to take fentanyl or heroin or whatever they were doing before. That's, 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 the, um, that's what you want to try to avoid. Okay, so actually, I guess I kind of talked about day two. Um, but what you want to do on day two, so they, day one, they've gotten to a, to a dose, uh, say 16 milligrams or so. Um, then that next day, they can take that full 16 milligrams that they took on the first day, or they can split up that dose, uh, eight and eight or something like that. Um, certainly a lot of patients prefer split dosing. Um, and then add on to that if they're still having withdrawal symptoms, another four milligrams, uh, even another eight milligrams uh, to get to 24 milligrams, that, that's fine to treat whatever withdrawal symptoms they're having. Um, again, remind them if they're getting sedated, just back off on the dose. You don't need that much if you're getting sedated. 
um, day three to seven. Um, again, you can they'll probably be at the dose they need, but you can titrate up or down still based on their symptoms. Um, you want to recommend follow up. You, you certainly want to see them within seven days of, of initiating buprenorphine. Um, and you should have support staff follow up with them um, between that. How did the initiation go? How much are they taking? What's their schedule? You want to you want to talk to them about it because if if something went wrong, you want to know about that. If they're you know patients may and patients aren't always the best at just reaching out to you. So you so um, you can call them and say just how did this go? What questions do you have? How how can we be helpful at this point? Um, did you even start it? <laughs> That's a big thing. Uh, why not? You know you can have that discussion with them before the next appointment if it's a week later. Um, okay, so I think we have a case, yeah, discussion. Any any questions before we, I'm gonna do a little case presentation and then we'll, was there something in the chat or no? Yeah, I think Dr. Shante, did you have a question? It was much earlier. Yes, I was asking about oh. ecstasy. I I am I practice in the metro Detroit area, and I yeah. hear about a lot of people using ecstasy. I'm gonna be honest; I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure what is in ecstasy. I think it's poly substances, but my thoughts is just I heard, had some understanding that there's some heroin analog in those pills, and I was just wondering if people use ecstasy, which label of substance use disorder would that be? My thoughts is it may be opioid use disorder. I, I don't know. It's a well, pill. The, the ecstasy is is MDMA, which is a, it's a it's a different Club. class of of, of drug. Um, it's it's derived from stimulants. It's got stimulant properties. It's got hallucinogenic uh, properties, but it's, it's just a different class of drugs. It's certainly addictive, but it's a different class of drugs. Um, almost everything is being laced with fentanyl at this mm -hmm. point. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if fentanyl is in these ecstasy pills that, that people are taking now. But, um, but ecstasy itself is... is is a different drug. I'm just saying that the patient may not be aware that they're that's not all they're taking uh, when when they when they take that. So mostly a stimulant use disorder. If they use abuse, that maybe it's a it's an MDMA uh, use disorder. Um, it's, it's okay. Not really, yeah, it's it's not exactly a stimulant. It's not exactly a hallucinogen either. It's just, it's its own class of you could you could call it ecstasy use disorder. So I'm wondering, will next now Trexone help with the cravings of that? Is what my is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> no, if it's if no, it's just ecstasy, it won't. Okay, it's just, that's a separate thing. There's, we don't have a pharmacological treatment for that one. Wow. Yeah. Okay, it's a problem though. It's spe specifically yeah. in this area. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but but the, it's like a lot of substances. We we don't have a pharma. There's only a few of them we actually have a pharmacological treatment for. So, okay, you thank you. Uh, okay, so here's the case. We can go through this kind of quickly. So, uh, so Je Jenny is 23 year old social work graduate student. Comes in for heroin use. She's comfortable. She's not yet in opioid withdrawal. Um, she tells you that she has felt anxious for most of her life. She started smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol on the weekends in high school. And in college, a friend gave her some oxycodone. And she said, in addition to pain control, her anxiety went down. She felt normal. She felt peaceful. Um, so she started buying this from her friends, got up to 200 milligrams a day of oxycodone. Uh, a year ago, she went to a 28-day residential program. Never followed up in aftercare though, and she relapsed uh, six weeks later. She's never been on medications for opioid use disorder. Um, due to cost and availability, she switched from oxycodone to snorting heroin, um, which is fentanyl, uh, about 10 bags a day. And uh, her last use was four hours ago. So some of the things you wanna think about, is Jenny currently ready for buprenorphine initiate? What are people's thoughts? What are, is, is she ready for buprenorphine induction uh, right now?
you can put it in the chat if you want. So, so I got I got a no, um, and that is, I would say that is correct. <laughs> so if not, why? How would you know? How would you decide if she's ready? And I see somebody said in the chat that she is not in withdrawal yet. So that that's the key thing. If she if she's not in withdrawal, she's not ready. She's gonna go. She's gonna, she'll have precipitated withdrawal if you start buprenorphine right now. So how about is she a candidate for home initiations? Unobserved home initiation. We probably want to know some other things, but based on what we know, yeah, she's 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 a good candidate for home initiation. One of the things that you want to know for home initiation. Does this person have a home? <laughs> That's right. Uh, she appears to, as far as we know. So she's probably a good candidate for, for a home initiation. She has some support. She's a, she's a pretty good candidate for that. Uh, OK. Advance here. Yeah. All right. So you explained that since she's physically dependent on opioids, she has to be in mild to moderate withdrawal. Um, she understands that. So you tell her to discontinue all opioids for at least 16 hours and monitor her withdrawal symptoms. Now, this was based on hair. We probably should, you know, <laughs> if she's using fentanyl, it should be more than that, but um, okay. Uh, so after 20 hours, she's uh, experiencing pilar erection, uh, muscle aches, nausea, yawning, rhinorrhea, anxiety, insomnia. She has not used opioids since she left the office yesterday. So is she ready for the initiation now? Pause, hopefully we're getting, yes, she is ready now. She's clearly in opioid withdrawal. So she's ready for, um, for the initiation at this point. So she takes uh, two milligrams. Uh, so two milligrams of buprenorphine, 0.5 is the uh, naloxone that's in there. So uh, two milligrams of buprenorphine. How long until that uh, the initial effect? And how long until the peak effect? I guess I'll just tell you what it. So the uh, the initial effect should be within about a half hour, um, and then the peak effect is going to be within two or three hours of that buprenorphine. Uh, so, um, so that so you can kind of base your uh, titration on that. It's Thirty minutes to start, but it won't be fully effective for two to three hours. That's why we say to wait an hour before making a dose adjustment uh, with folks. So, forty-five minutes after her initial dose, she has no change in her withdrawal symptom. So she takes the rest of that uh, eight milligram film. And what would you tell her about additional day one doses? Can she take any more on that on day one? How much more? So what the you want to you would tell her to titrate probably by four milligrams at a time, but uh, you get up to uh, I would say a maximum of sixteen uh, milligrams on that first day. You can go more beyond that, but on that first day. 16 milligrams is a good start. Okay, so she takes 16 milligrams on day one to five. Uh, on day five, she's still taking that 16 milligrams. She says she feels 80% better, continues to have some mild cramping in her calves, some anxiety, some insomnia. Um, what other history would you obtain? Um, but what, what would you do? What would you counsel her in this situation? Does she stay at this dose? Should she change the dose? So I would say that she can increase that dose. She's still getting some symptoms. She said she's 80% better. She's not 100% better. So increase the dose. She's not She's not complaining of sedation. That, that's probably the other history that you want to get. Is she having other side effects from the buprenorphine? Um, but in the absence of that, she can go ahead and increase that dose. 
see if that can help with some of this cramping that she's getting, the anxiety, the insomnia, all of that can be residual uh, withdrawal symptoms. So go ahead and treat that. You can, there's, there's lots of kind of milder withdrawal symptoms that the patient may not even recognize after, as a withdrawal. Uh, sometimes it can be mood, sometimes it can be depression. This is, go ahead and increase that dose. You can get up to 24 milligrams. Uh, very, I'm not hesitant at all to get people up to 24 milligrams and see how they do. If they're better, great, continue that dose. If they're worse, you can go back to the 16, that's fine. Um, but that's what I would ask about. And also you wanna ask about, is she still using other substances? Uh, you know, and all the other kind of, how, what's her sleep like? All these other things that you wanna ask about. Stop. Dr. Morrow, we have a hand raised. Oh, great. Okay. Go yeah. ahead, Anne. Why don't you unmute? Hi. Hi. Um, Hello. I'm Amy. Now, when you guys are first, like in this example, um, when you're first dosing somebody, um, are do you have them in the office? So and not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah, in, in fact, nowadays, I, I, it's almost always a virtual appointment. So I'll have, they'll, they'll be at home. I'll give them instructions on how to do it themselves. And they'll do this initiation on their own, uh, typically. So there's, sometimes there's an exception. Uh, like I said, for maybe the person doesn't have a home or maybe they, I, I suspect they, maybe they have cognitive impairment or something. I really don't think that they're going to be able to follow these instructions very well. Um, but usually it's going to be a home induction. Okay. I just didn't know because you were talking about if they had reactions or if it wasn't enough or because yeah. they may not know that, but you may know that by watching reactions or or your staff watching them. Um, right. I mean, that, that that's one of the advantages of doing it in the office is that you have a lot of observation there. You can see this as, as it's happening. Um, but, I guess I've know. never had the chance to ask a doctor if if they, um, you know, watch that and see, oh, yeah. you need more. Yeah, yeah, you can see it, and so you can give more kind of real time advice if they're in the office like that. Um, but it, I mean, it's so inconvenient for the patients to do that 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 advantage is often overshadowed by the, the advantage of them being at home and having control over that. And then what you can do is correspond with them uh, over the phone or something like that about their symptoms. And when, when they have questions, they can call in. You definitely want to have an open line of communication with them while they're doing this. Um, but as long as you have that, then you can get some feedback and, and tell them how to manage these symptoms. Um, okay. But like I say, it, it, it's not going to be the first time they've had these symptoms. So uh, they, most of them are going to be able to manage that pretty well, uh, even without your kind of intervention there. Yeah. Thank you. And then Dr. Morrow, it's what about yeah. Benadryl Visceral to help with insomnia or anxiety? Uh, you can use that. Uh, visceral, visceral is pretty good for anxiety. Um, I don't like using Benadryl for sleep. It's got a lot of side effects with it. So I'd rather use something like trazodone or, uh, or a low dose of doxepin, which has, it just, it's really the same mechanism. It just has less uh, side effects associated with it. So uh, Benadryl is fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like the, I don't, what I don't like is the benzodiazepines just because there's an added risk of overdose, especially for somebody with opioid use disorder. Yeah. I've also found that I, I like to very upfront really tell the patients as we're getting started, your sleep's not going to be good for the next few weeks. I can prescribe things. They may or may not help. A lot of times they don't um, because sometimes patients are asking for something for sleep and really the buprenorphine is going to help their sleep the most. So getting them on the right dose is what I try and refocus them on. Yeah. Yeah, if they, I mean, a lot. most of the time, I would say, if they get on an adequate dose of buprenorphine, they're just not going to have opioid withdrawal symptoms. They're going to be fine. Um, so just, just get them up to that dose and they'll, they'll be totally fine from a physical perspective, <laughs> at least. So. 
All right, other questions? I think that was it for this section, so. So were we gonna take a break? What was the, I forget what the schedule was. Were we gonna take a little break at this point or? Yeah, let's take a break. Um, maybe we could do, we're doing well on time. So maybe we could do about, well, maybe we're not doing that great. On, maybe we'll do about 10 minutes. Could we come back please at 10, 23? Sounds great. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you at 10, 23. Welcome back. It is 1023. Um, we will get started here in just a few seconds, give folks a chance to rejoin and sit down. Um, we will continue to move through our material this morning. Thanks so much for sticking it out with us. And please, again, if you have any questions or anything that comes to mind, um, shout it out in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute and let us know. Um, it makes it makes for a great a great morning. Oh man, I can see that it's not right. Uh, let me try again. Oops. How does that look? Am I not sharing now? I'm not sharing. Hold on. Not quite yet. How's that? There we go. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's, oops, sorry. Now let's go through um, the outpatient management of of, or mostly outpatient management of patients that have been started on buprenorphine. So as Dr. Morrow walked us through in the last section, we have our patient on buprenorphine. We have them at what we think is the right dose, at least for now. So now what? Now what do we do? So we're often called and asked how, uh, how often we should see these patients in clinic. Um, if you refer to, if you look in, you know, some of the more commonly used outpatient buprenorphine treatment manuals, they, they basically say use your clinical judgment. So the, there's um, a great one from Boston Medical University, and they say once stable clinic visits every two to four weeks with refills that coincide with visits. The SAMHSA manual says base management of opioid use disorder, including the frequency of office visits on a comprehensive assessment that is updated throughout treatment. What, what I usually do is I like to see patients, especially if they're very new to sort of the whole world of treatment, I like to see them weekly for about four weeks and then every two weeks and then every three weeks and then every four weeks. Um, but, you know, it really depends on the patient. If they're doing well every two weeks and then they sort of fall apart and start using again, then I, I go back to seeing them weekly. So um, every one week to four weeks, depending on know how they're doing clinically, I would say. That's how I would answer that question. So what, what when they come back to see you and you know they're stable on their dose of buprenorphine naloxone, what do we what do we ask them about? Um I like to I, I ask about any drug, alcohol, or to, or tobacco use. Ideally every session, although that's not always possible, um, I do try and ask at least about opioid use at every session. You know, have you used any opioids since I last saw you? Um, or, you know, whatever whatever other addictions they have, if they, if they also have a coexisting methamphetamine use disorder, asking about that is probably very important too. You know, I check how they're dosing, how, how long between they're dosing their medication. I check their sublingual technique. I find that this is important. You know, sometimes patients will come in and say like, medicine's not working anymore. Um, I'm having horrible withdrawals. I'm up all night. And I say, okay, well, could you walk me through how you, how you take the medicine? Oh, well, I put it under my tongue and then I drink a lot of coffee and then, um, you know, it's washed, it's washed down my throat. So, you know, they're not getting any effects from their medicine. Just one minute. <laughs> Sorry. So sorry, I had a visitor. 
Um, okay, and then what else? Uh, I, I remind them that, you know, this is a sublingual or a buccal medication. It needs to be absorbed that way in order to be effective. So I ask that they not smoke for about 30 minutes before they use their medication. If they're smoking, whatever they're smoking, I ask that they not do that. Many patients with opioid use disorder have coexisting nicotine use disorders as well. And many, many of them smoke. So, um, you know, I, I let them know that we want, we don't want them to have a dry mouth. So to, to drink a little bit of water before they, um, Dose their medication. I tell them to put it under their tongue to the left or the right of the frenulum and then just sit there. You wait. You don't talk. You don't eat. You don't drink anything. If the medicine's too gross or their mouth is too dry, they can use a mint with it. Um, but I tell them it takes about five to 10 minutes for the medication to dissolve. If the film's slipping around, maybe their, their mouth is too wet. Maybe they can't use the mint or they can't, you know, use, they should drink less water before they dose the medicine. If the film's taking more than 10 minutes to dissolve, maybe their mouth's too dry. So maybe they need to adjust on, in, on some way. I, I will say that um, also, um, I have had patients that say that, that their medicine isn't working after they've been on it for years. And there's, there's many medications we we prescribe that have some anticholinergic effects that um, cause some dry mouth. So for example, you know, someone who's starting on, on um, sertraline or increase their dose of sertraline, and then they feel like they're not getting as much of a effect from the buprenorphine. So just watch out for that. It can pop up from time to time. Um, and just, you know, even patients who have been on buprenorphine for years, I find, I, sometimes I'm surprised, um, you know, wait, what? You're drinking your coffee with your buprenorphine? Um, and just you know, reminding them how to dose sublingual medicines or, or reminding them again um, is can be helpful. I like to go over safe storage. I like to go over that the first time I meet them, especially if they're children in the house. Um, we don't want their children getting into their buprenorphine, especially if they're, you know, cutting their films or taking half a film and there's open packets around. So make sure the buprenorphine is somewhere locked, somewhere high, kept out of reach from children. Or, you know, if, if, if they've had their buprenorphine go missing in the past, just keeping it out of sight is important. Check in if they have any withdrawal symptoms or opioid side effects, you know, maybe a dose adjustment might be needed. Talk to them about how they're managing their cravings. Have they had any cravings that have been caused by specific triggers? Um, also something I like to check in about. Check in on their mood, their sleep, pain. I have a lot of patients with coexisting um, pain or conditions that cause them a lot of pain. So talking to them about that, because often for my patients, at least the pain is, is extremely triggering and can lead to a lot of their cravings. Talk to them about how they're doing, rebuilding their life. You know, how's it going? Rebuilding relationships, finding a job, housing, legal issues. Ask them about counseling or if they're going to any groups and then review the urine drug screen results, which we'll get to in a minute. Dr. Sethi, there's a quick question in the chat. Um, is the MAT in conjunction with outpatient substance abuse clinician also? Is coordination of care also considered with their PCP being aware for additional support? Um, okay, so we'll get to this in a minute. We'll present some evidence, but it, this, this medication treatment can be in conjunction with an outpatient counseling, it can be, it can also be without it. It can just be in their primary care office, getting them started and then, you know, figuring, figuring out where, what they'll do for additional counseling afterwards. Um, I think coordination of care is, is always great. Um, so if they will allow, you know, if I'm just doing just treating their addiction and they'll allow me to communicate with their primary care doctor, then I, then I, I, I love that. However, sometimes due to the stigma of addiction, I've had many patients not be comfortable with that. I've had a patient who, um, I've had a patient come see me just for their addiction treatment. And I knew, I knew their primary care doctor. He was a, he's a wonderful doctor who prescribes buprenorphine and a very compassionate clinician, but they just didn't feel comfortable mixing those two worlds. So um, I honored that. So it really could be just patient preference. For the dosing, um, really, 
what I like to tell my patients is, um, let's find a schedule for you and then let's stick to it. Uh, I, I try, I'm trying to get them to move away from taking the medicine as needed. You know, I, I had a backache, so I took some extra, I, you know, had this craving, so I took some extra, um, you know, for many of my patients with pain, the therapeutic effect of the buprenorphine to treat pain is about four to six hours. So they do better with three or four times a day dosing. I've had patients who have really felt more comfortable dosing at six times a day. If that's what works for them, that's fine. Again, I just try and get them to get on some sort of schedule. So when I say cravings, what is a craving? Um, it's officially defined as a drug acquisitive state motivating drug use. Um, but really, I, more simply, I, I describe it to my patients as like a, an urge to use the opioid or urge to use whatever drug we're talking about. So inhibiting cravings is a treatment goal. It's been associated with decreased use and improved quality of life. Um, but there's 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 different types of cravings. You know, there's cravings that are cue-induced, cue stress-induced. Um, and, you know, for, for, for most of my patients, I'd say buprenorphine doesn't completely suppress those cravings. You know, if they walk into a room and someone is using right in front of them, you know, I, most, most of, most patients with opioid use disorder would have cravings in that setting. Um, there's also, um, some, my patients describe some sort of more tonic craving, uh, baseline cravings. Um, and hopefully buprenorphine will help more with those types of cravings. But the cravings are dynamic. They vary throughout the day. Um, they're really personal as well. So I would talk to your patient about what they feel, how, how they experience cravings, what really bothers them about them, and you know, um, base your treatment plan around that. Is there another question? I see a, no, okay. Okay, so some official recommendations are to monitor liver enzymes, um, but there's really not much evidence to guide how frequently. So I'd say every six months is, is probably fine. Um, ensure the patient is up to date on preventative care, vaccinations, treat other medical conditions, check them for hep C, offer STI screening, um, Offer PrEP, you know, if a patient is um, having unprotected sexual encounters or if they're using needles, they, they qualify for PrEP. And with the new change in guidelines last year, really any patient who expresses an interest that they would like to receive PrEP, that, that meets the criteria. So if a patient expresses interest or really meets the guidelines for pre-exposure HIV prophylaxis, I would offer them that as well. And then I also talk to my patients, my my patients with a uterus, if they are trying to conceive or interested in um, a pregnancy. Um, there's evidence to suggest 80% of pregnancies in patients with opioid use disorders are unintended. So if a patient is interested, um, the long acting uh, contraceptive like an IUD is, is a great choice too. Um, but, you know, again, going back to the effects of opioids, opioids do cause, um, can cause some um, amenorrhea in patients that have menstrual periods. So many patients, many, many patients express to me that they don't feel like they can get pregnant. And that might, that might definitely not be the case. So it's important to talk to them about what they're doing to tr try to prevent pregnancy if, if that's not what they want. If they do want if they are interested in pregnancy or open to it, I prescribe them a prenatal vitamin. Um, but I also try and document, um, you know, just in terms of birth control, what the patient's plan is, um, if it affects that patient. This is just, you know, this. Uh, you can reject these or use them as, as it's convenient for you. But when I prescribe a month's worth of medication, I usually prescribe 28 days so the patient doesn't run out before they see me or run out on a weekend. And then I try and see the patient every 28 days instead of every month. That doesn't always work out as we know, but um, that's uh, one suggestion. And then I already mentioned this, we can prescribe a half film of buprenorphine in Michigan or a half tablet. So 1.5 films per day. For the tablets, I, 
find that it's difficult to prescribe um, them in any other, if, if you're prescribing less than half, they kind of crumble. So you can't prescribe a quarter of a tablet. You can prescribe a half, although most of my patients don't like that. They feel that that when they break them, there's too much, um, as one patient called it, quote unquote, buprenorphine dust that's lost. So um, I, I try and prescribe the tablets in their whole forms and not, not, not prescribe them in a half form. Um, Michigan Medicaid will cover a maximum dose of 24-6 milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone daily. If you have patients that um, you feel like need more, there are there might there might be another way to prescribe more. So you can contact us and we can talk to you more about that. Um, buprenorphine or opioids in general can have activating effects on some patients. Um, so some patients will describe that they take their buprenorphine, they need to take their buprenorphine like their coffee to get their day started or you know get things done. Um, so if a patient is describing if they're having insomnia, sometimes sometimes um, just moving up their last dose and, and earlier in the day can have some helpful effects. Um, also just, I mean, this doesn't happen often, but if you know, you're know you trying to figure out the right dose for the patient and they're coming in and they seem like they might be hypomanic, you could consider reduce, reducing their dose. I've only seen that once, but something to keep in mind. And then also if they're reporting fatigue, their dose may be too high. Okay, the urine drug screen, do we have any questions? Let's see. Um, question, or they can have a secondary diagnosis of ADHD or bipolar, definitely. Um, I think we had a section on this earlier, but maybe not, but um, you know, coexisting um, psychiatric conditions are, are very, very common in this patient population. So we do see a lot of ADHD, bipolar, generalized anxiety disorder. It's difficult sometimes to um, determine if the symptoms are substance-induced or independent from the substance. So oftentimes really assessing symptoms of ADHD or bipolar, if, if you can, wait a few months till they are stable on their buprenorphine and are not using illicit substances, that would be the best time for an evaluation. But um, sometimes, as you know, we cannot wait. So, and I think Dr. Shante has hand raised. Yes, that was me that made that comment. It remind, reminded me of Dr. Um, Morrow when he mentioned about Benadryl can have side effects. I've heard people tell me that when they take Benadryl, it activates them where they get hyper. And so, you know, it's almost like people, some people with maybe bipolar attention deficit, Benadryl is activating for them. It provokes the, ma the mania in them. And that's what it sounds like, you know, with this bup with some people. Yeah. People. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just think it's important to keep in mind, um, not for most, most people, but for some people. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Um, all right, let's talk about toxicology. Um, okay, so so um, the vast majority of time we do a urine drug screen for our toxicology, but there are other ways to do it. But I'm really gonna focus on the urine drug screen because that's the bulk of what we do. It's a consensual diagnostic test used to monitor treatment, and it provides objective data about the patient's drug use. It aids in diagnosis and monitoring. It can help us advocate for the patient or family in third-party issues. Um, for example, if the patient is on a medic, if the patient is also getting a urine drug screen done in a correctional setting, and they, I know that they have frequent false positives for another substance due to, you know, one of their prescribed medications, um, I've had to communicate with their PO officers about that. Um, the urine drug screen can, can improve and you know aid in your communication with your patients, but each test is different and each test has a different cutoff value. So I would just get to know your test. And sometimes that's hard to do because, you know, we're really at the, you know, the lab may change the test or, you know, your test may go out of stock and then you have to, you know, get another test. But just know that 
you know, they're not, there's a lot of false positives and false negatives with the point of care test. Um, so don't use it as a be all or end all. So it's something we're doing for the patient. We're not doing it to the patient. We're not using it to try and trick them or um, catch them. It's just something that's going to help us. And I will say too, for patients that, you know, as you get to know your patients and as they get to trust you and you trust them, um, it becomes sort of a uh, an afterthought, you know, um, I'll have the urine drug screen results, but the patient will list off, you know, I used fentanyl last week, I used methamphetamine three days ago. You know, if the patient is communicating with me, then I, I you know, the urine drug screen becomes much less valuable. And really that's the goal. So how often should we do the urine drug screen? Um, and this tip has been updated, so I have to pull the most updated one, but it's, um, it's a, as per the SAMHSA guide, it should be done periodically, periodic random testing, frequency clinically determined. So again, just go back to using your clinical judgment. Um, if you, you know, there's multiple physicians I work with at the Michigan Opioid Collaborative, I think we probably all have our own approach. Um, and that would probably also uh, speak to how different our patient population is. But I would say, you know, definitely at the initial evaluation, um, maybe more frequently early on, then you could move to less frequently. And again, if I have a patient that's coming in and they're holding their urine drug screen cup, but they're listing off all the drugs they've done in the last few weeks, then that, you know, I'm not going to waste the cup because they're already telling me what's going on. Um, also important to check into regular um, regulation and reimbursement. Um, as far as I know, now that the buprenorphine rules in Michigan has changed, there are no regulations around um, buprenorphine testing in the outpatient setting. And then urine is prefer uh, preferred, as I mentioned. It's easy to obtain, low cost, and we know, you know, we have some idea about the persistence of and the presence of the metabolites. Well, you get this question a lot too. What about telehealth? Um, and this is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine's uh, guide, their manual. Clinicians and programs should carefully weigh the risk and benefits of drug testing, both for the patient and for community public health. As always, it is prudent to avoid ordering tests, which the results will not change the patient's management. Um, and so, you know, with telehealth, I think it is a little more tricky, especially if, you know, you're practicing in a more rural setting and it, it the patient's going to take an hour to reach you. Um, but I think you should work it into your management as, as you feel comfortable. And again, based on how the patient is doing clinically. This is just here as reference. Um, you can Google this as you need it, but just a reminder that, um, you know, if, if we see uh, morphine in the urine, the patient could have done heroin, they could have done codeine. Um, the, the opioids and opiates break down um, to different products. And so that's generally what we're working for in the urine drug screen. But just, you know, if, if the patient was prescribed hydrocodone, but we see hydromorphone in the urine, that is definitely possible based on how the drugs metabolize. And so just know that um, before, uh, bef um, before you, go in to talk to your patient about what they're taking. And uh, there's also, go ahead, go ahead. No, there's there's just a question in the chat. I wasn't sure if you could still see it or not. No, I had to put it. I can't, I can't do two things at once. I do, you, it. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> do you use a urine drug screen to discontinue a patient's buprenorphine prescription or as a basis for dismissal? Or do you use this as a counseling tool? That's a great question. Um, so um, there's different types of urine drug screens. Let's see. There are the point of care tests, which are not very accurate. And as you can see, the average detection time for most drugs, almost all of the drugs we're testing is really only a couple of days. Um, these. These tests are not, again, not accurate. 
look, look at all these drugs that can cause a false positive. You know, for, for methamphetamine also, especially a lot of drugs cause a, um, a false positive for methamphetamine. Um, um, I, I have also seen patients on 24 milligrams of buprenorphine where the, the urine drug screen test is coming up negative for buprenorphine and the patient is getting really upset. You know, I've taken my buprenorphine. I don't know why this is negative. So if there's some sort of discrepancy, if there's a discrepancy about what, you know, the patient feels the urine drug screen is not accurate, I always send it for a gas or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. I do not make any clinical decisions based on these point of care ELISA tests that are very, very inaccurate. Um, I would think of each assay also as a separate test. So the methamphetamine is separate from the benzodiazepines is separate from the opioid test. Again, remember um, the buprenorphine, every synthetic opioid, so buprenorphine, fentanyl, those are separate tests that buprenorphine will not show up with the opioids. So um, So, so no, generally I try not to base any clinical dis decisions or dis, dis, you know, a dismissal of the patient, quote unquote, dismissal of the patient based on the um, toxicology testing. I, I will make clinical de decisions based on patterns that I see from tests. Um, this is not an addiction, <laughs> an example from addiction, but um I just remember when I was a resident and we were on the floors, we had a we had a very sick patient who was really presenting like she was in right-sided heart failure. Um, and she had some, some contraindications. We were also worried that she had a PE, but there were some contraindications with um, chronic kidney disease that we couldn't really give her contrast. So we were just scared. You know, she was very complex. We thought we were missing something. We didn't know what it was. And so we sent her very early on in her hospital course for an, an echo and her echo came back looking like just like perfect there was like almost nothing abnormal on it and so later in the course of her hospitalization we decided to do another echo really to see if there was any right heart strain because we thought maybe maybe that's a way we could check for a PE because we didn't feel comfortable giving her the contrast to do another study and her echo came back with like very severe uh, right right and left sided heart failure and we ended up going back down with going to the the radiology department because you know in 10 days how could how could how could the patient have such a severe deterioration and and you know there was a mistake the the first echo was the re results were mislabeled um and so I always, I just always try and keep that in mind. You know, um, I, I don't think, I, I think that's a very extreme example. And I doubt that that happens very often, but it happens, you know? And so I've had very, very stable patients um, come back. They're, they're, you know, gas chromatography will come back with Xanax or, and, you know, they are so upset. They haven't used Xanax and, you know, I, I repeat the test and I just keep looking for a pattern. And if, you know, a year goes by and I don't see alprazolam in their urine, you know, it's it's always possible mistakes happen. So I just put that out there too, because um, I have seen that happen. And, um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I base my clinical decisions based on patterns from the urine drug screen, not on any one particular test. I hope that answers your question. That was a very long answer. I'm sorry. I, I talk too much. That's feedback I get from my patients too. So. Um, just another thing with the, the gas or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, it's, it's often, you'll often get quantitative results. So you'll get numbers and levels. I, I really try not to, um, to put too much weight on the levels. They can vary based on, you know, when the medication was dosed versus when the sample was collected, patient's metabolism, other drugs they're taking at the time, their hydration status. So I, I would really try and not put too much weight onto the levels. Are, are there other, that was a great question about the, your, the toxicology results. Are there any other questions? Okay, I'll keep going. Dealing with unexpected toxicology results, just try and talk to your patient about it, send confirmatory testing, and don't use the clinical test to make, the screening test to make clinical decisions. 
I like to use open-ended questions too when I'm talking to the patient about the urine, you know, is there anything you want to tell me about the urine or really allow them to, to, um, to tell me. I find that that helps build trust too. Okay. If there's no more questions about toxicology, then we'll move on to psychosocial support, which I think we had a question about this earlier. There's a lot of ways that our patients can find psychosocial support. You know, I think many of us probably practice in settings where we can offer them some, ther some therapy um, in, our, in our offices. Many of us don't though. So, you know, talking to patients about mutual support groups, some of these are more friendly to patients that are on buprenorphine than others. So I also make sure to talk to them about that. Um, individual therapy, group therapy, family counseling, intensive outpatient programs. So there are um, at least three randomized control trials that have shown that additional behavioral therapy does not significantly improve outcomes um, versus just medical management. So just the patient going to their doctor and getting buprenorphine from a doctor. So while I offer all my patients psychosocial support um, and I encourage them to seek it as I think it's really crucial to um, their healing, I don't deny them a medication or withhold a medication if they decline to seek such support. I just continue to encourage them to engage. Uh, Many of my, my patients ha do have significant histories of trauma and they really have to be ready to be able to talk about those things. And sometimes it just, it just takes them a while. I've had patients that have not been able to seek therapy for a year. Um, I had a patient um, who was a man who was sexually abused when he was eight and he, it took him a year to go to therapy. And, you know, he would agree and then he would miss the appointment and then he would lose the spot. But it took him a year before he actually made it to that appointment because, you know, he did share with me that he just, he couldn't, he didn't feel like he could talk about it because his life would fall apart when he talked about it. And he thought that in therapy, he would be required to talk about it. And so we have a comment, recommendation, encourage those who are successful in their recovery to consider being trained as a certified recovery coach, much needed discipline as members of mental behavioral substance abuse treatment teams. Yes, I love that. Um, any questions about psychosocial support? If a patient also is, you know, is very hesitant about individual therapy, really, I try and encourage them to at least join, to, to really join the mutual support groups as a good first step too. If anything, just, um, trying to find friends that are have similar goals to them can be very, you know, can be empowering and can be really helpful for them. But again, I don't, I don't really mandate any of any of it. I don't man, I don't mandate any of it. So how long should a patient remain on buprenorphine? How long should we prescribe the patient buprenorphine? So again, from the American Society of Addiction Medicine guidelines. While there is limited research on the optimal length of addiction treatment, the available research generally su suggests that longer duration of treatment results in better outcomes. From the SAMHSA guide, the best results occur when a patient receives a medication for as long as it provides a benefit, and this is often called maintenance treatment. Once they're stabilized on their opioid use disorder medication, many patients stop using illicit opioids completely. Others continue to use for some time, but less frequently and in smaller amounts, which reduces their risk of morbidity and overdose death. And, you know, it's the studies suggest rates of, of um, return to opioid use at about 50 to 90% at a one month after buprenorphine taper or discontinuation. And the majority of these studies are, um, the patient was given sort of a schedule. The patient didn't have a say in tapering or discontinuation. And so I, I hesitate, I hesitate to use that number with patients because if a patient is, you know, doing well, they're, you have been on buprenorphine for several years. They've been stable in their treatment for several years. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that 
really I can generalize those results to the patient in front of me always. And so we talk about that, you know, it does seem like patients do do better with tapers when they've been retained in treatment longer, if they've been on buprenorphine longer. And there's some weak evidence that suggests that the slow taper over extended out extended time period might have the best outcomes. So I really just, you know, try and, you know, talk to them. What's their motivation? You know, why do they want to do it now? What's different than before? You know, what will happen if they feel like they're going to use? Um, for most of my patients that have been stable and we've tried to taper, we've gotten to a lower dose, you know, two milligrams, four milligrams, but many of them are not able to complete the taper. Um, many of them are too scared. They're scared that they're going to lose, you know, what they've what they've been able to achieve since they've started treatment. Um, so, you know, that that's reasonable to just continue them on their buprenorphine too. I try and follow up with the patients after if, you know, if we've completed the taper too, um, at least a month after, and then every couple of months just to check in and make sure they're doing well. I hope there's any questions about that. I don't remember if there was a question earlier. The PDMP prescription drug monitoring programs, a statewide system tracking prescriptions. Medications dispensed from opioid treatment programs are not always listed on these um, in these uh, on these websites. They can be, but they're not always. And there's also a lack of communication between state programs, which I know, you know, if you have a patient in Toledo, sometimes that's difficult, or you know, in another part, another state. There's there's a lag in data. There's limitation in who can access reports. And sometimes they're inaccurate. Not, not often, but that again, that mistakes happen always. So, um, but you are required to check this in Michigan before you prescribe a controlled substance. So please do check it. Pill counts. I find these difficult to do in primary care settings. They're not required. You really have to be set up to do them. You can do them when you ex uh, suspect diversion or you suspect that a patient is selling or giving away part of their buprenorphine. Um, but what I usually do is just have the patient come in person more frequently, or that's what I would recommend. But you just have the patient count their tabs or films in front of the staff and you just, you they should be about, you know, if they're off a, a film or two, you don't, it's okay, but it should be about equal to what you suspect the quantity is. Okay, so um, buprenorphine and methadone do not treat non-opioid drug use, mental health issues, adherence to healthcare recommendations, and psychosocial stressors, unfortunately. Um, and naltrexone, we have a question. Do we have to check the maps prior to naltrexone um, prescriptions as well? Naltrexone is not a controlled substance, so no, you do not just the controlled substances. So what kind of timeline are we looking at in terms of a patient's progress? You know, the induction can take days to weeks, but the cessation of the acute withdrawal symptoms as Dr. Morrow mentioned can, can also take days to weeks. Um, with the fentanyl being so lipophilic and leaching out, at, sometimes it, it, it's closer to a month before I really feel like a patient is starting, it's starting to, before they, they tell me they quote, feel quote unquote normal before they really feel better. Um, and that can look like, you know, lethargy, fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, but, um, you know, depending on how long they've used, how much they were using, sometimes it's, sometimes even if they're, after they're on their target dose of buprenorphine, it's a few weeks before I, they really feel like they're doing better. What about cessation of opioid use? You know, that can also take days to weeks, sometimes months. Um, and so just checking in, asking if the patient is still using, asking what happened if, after they used, how it made them feel, exploring all, all this with the patient is important. And then cessation of other drug use and stabilization of the psychosocial issues can really take months to years. And so that's that's something we work on once the patient, what, what I, that I work on once the patient is physically feeling better, which is often also why if, you know, a patient's coming in and they're hesitant about counseling. That's something I try and address, you know, after they're telling me they're feeling physically feeling better. Then I feel like they're in a better mental, mental, you know, headspace to to think about, you know, taking on more appointments and taking on discussing some of their past traumas and stressors. 
What happens when a patient um, has a recurrence of their substance use disorder or a quote unquote relapse? So that's a process in which a patient returns to substance use. Um, it usually occurs in response to stressors and stimuli, and many things can cause it. You know, ask your patient what they think is causing it. Sometimes they don't know, but sometimes they can identify, you know, I was angry, I was stressed, I fought with my wife, I, um, you know, I ran into someone who offered me some drugs and then we went and used them, et cetera. I have boredom, I have boredom um, bolded here because... Um, you know, in 2020 with the pandemic, with the abrupt onset of, you know, everything shutting down, I, I cannot tell you how many patients identified boredom as really a, um, as leading to their, to their um, recurrence of, of using. And so I think sometimes it's worth it to explore that with a patient. If they're telling you that they don't know what to do or they don't know what to do with themselves. Like, I think it's worth, you know, brainstorming how they can use their time in productive ways um, to kind of get ahead of that. Um, oh, okay, great. I have that here. <laughs> um, after a patient use, they'll often, if they, if they come back to you or when they do come back to you, they'll often have a lot of guilt and shame. And so I really try and normalize, you know, that, that, you know, they, they, as, as Dr. Morrow explained much better than I ever could, they have these pathways that are, that are set up in their brain. They have, they're going to have cravings, many of them for the rest of their lives. So this, this is going to happen. You know, it's, it's more often the rule rather than the exception. And that's okay. You know, what's important is how we, you know, how they really handle the mistakes that they're making. And, and we can always learn from our mistakes. If someone is um, developing a pattern of returning to substance use, or they've just returned and they can't seem to stop and you feel like they've clinically deteriorated, that requires a evaluation and a review of their treatment plan though. They might do, they might do better then in a higher level of care, you know, either some sort of intensive outpatient program, residential program, um, a substance use disorder treatment center, um, et cetera. And, you know, if I have a patient who, who, you know, if that thought crosses my mind where I'm like, oh, I, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that this is the right setting for them anymore. I, I share that with them. I share that with them on the spot because, you know, then if the co conversation comes up in a month or a few weeks, it's not, it's not a surprise. Sometimes they don't remember what I said, so it is a surprise again. But you know, then at least you know it's an ongoing conversation. Um, so I really like to share those thoughts with my patients as soon as I'm having them. Polysubstance use is the rule and not the exception. I'm just gonna let some people in. So when we look at um, the postmortem toxicology for patients who have overdose deaths multiple substances are found the vast majority of the time. And when patients are using multiple substance risk, um, multiple substances, their overdose risk is increased for several reasons. So certain substances can mask the effect of others. So users can inadvertently take higher doses than normal because they don't feel the full effects of one substance. Enhanced respiratory depression, which we talked about. And then the risk of opioid naive persons receiving op opioid contaminated drugs. And I think in the last several years, there's been very, there's been some famous actors and musicians who have been, we've, we've theorized that they've passed away this, in this way, like, um, oh, what's his name? He's a wonderful actor, the man from The Wire. Um, he had, uh, what's his name? He was very famous on The Wire. Uh, but he he had he had been very open in the media about his struggles with cocaine, and he had a cocaine use disorder, um, and he passed away from an overdose. And so that was it was theorized that he per, perhaps received contaminated drugs. Um, I don't know if anyone likes The Wire, but maybe so maybe someone can help me out with his name. <laughs> it's going to bother me now. Observational studies demonstrate that a reduction in overdose deaths with prescribed buprenorphine and methadone take place in the real world where polysubstance use is common. So the, the study I shared earlier of 40,000 individuals or retrospective studies, 
um, you know, we're looking at patients that received a diagnosis of an opioid use disorder, but we know from the real world that polysubstance use is common. So um, I think that's also important to keep in mind. Yes, Michael K. Williams. What what was his? Does anybody know? What I'm going to Google this when 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 Dr. Morrow was talking, his name on the wire. But okay, so let's do a case. Uh, Katie, she's a 35 year old woman who, with a diagnosis of severe opioid use disorder and moderate cocaine use disorder, she's been treated with buprenorphine and naloxone, 16-4 milligrams daily for six months. She stopped using heroin or fentanyl, and that's confirmed by urine drug tests. However, her urine drug tests show evidence of continuous cocaine use. So how will we respond to her about this? What kind of questions will we want to know? What will we want to know about her cocaine use? Yeah, that's actually, that's a great question. What do we believe it helps her with, you know? What are her goals in terms of cocaine use, you know? Is she is she trying to stop? How, how much was she using it before she came into treatment and how much is she using now? You know, was she going, was she a daily user and now is she an episodic user? Um, in the spirit of harm reduction, you know, again, the buprenorphine treats her opioid use disorder. It does not treat her cocaine use disorder. And so if she really would like to completely stop using cocaine um, or it's interfering with her um, stability or, you know, progress, perhaps she needs treatment for cocaine use disorder, which is different than treatment for opioid use disorder. And does the nature of this stump, substance, stimulant versus a benzodiazepine, affect your treatment plan? And I, for me personally, again, I think if we asked five different clinicians would get five answers, but it, it would, because if, if I have a patient and they, I know that they're using another um, medication that causes some respiratory depression, like benzodiazepines or alcohol, and I'm seeing that in their urine drug screen, there's, there's more urgency in urgency for me there, because I, I am much more worried about that patient in terms of overdose risk. And I talk to my patients about that as well. But again, if you know, if this patient is 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 telling me that the cocaine use is very disruptive to her, to their life, if they feel that the cocaine use um, is disruptive to our treatment with the of her opioid use disorder, then then yes, I will be encouraging her to seek treatment for that as well. And so here's another case. Um, this is Kevin. He's a 31 year old man with chronic hepatitis C and opioid use disorder. And he just comes in asking for referral for, for hepatitis C treatment and he wants a physical. He's been on buprenorphine 16 4 for eight months and he lives with his wife and 10 year old daughter. And this, this is actually modeled off a patient that came to see me in 2017. And so at that time, he was prescribed buprenorphine naloxone from a cash only provider. She did not take his insurance and he had to drive over an hour from his house to go and see her. He had to get a second job to pay for the monthly visits and his prescription and she hadn't checked any labs. He was diagnosed with hep C when he was in jail. Actually, I think it was prison, but, um, and when he asked this provider about getting his hep C treated, she advised him to establish with a primary care doctor. Um, and so, you know, I chatted with him a little bit about his experience seeking treatment. And he told me that it was so much easier. It's so much easier for him to, to use heroin than get treatment. You know, he said that he knew where he could go get heroin on his lunch, could just go get it, he could use it. But getting treatment has been monumentally difficult for him. And um, really his wife had to help set up a lot of the appointments and um, find this provider. So uh, he started to come see me. Um, I took his insurance. So he was very grateful for that and the extra cash. 
Um, he, he worked, he continued to work and provide for his wife and daughter. But these things also happened in the course of a year. He called a week before his prescription was due to ask for an early refill because it had been stolen. Um, you know, and we just had him come in and, and had him uh, suggested he file a police report and filled his buprenorphine early. One time his urine drug screen came back positive for cocaine. When we talked about it, he had ran into someone that he used to use with. Um, and so he used cocaine and he was he was really upset with himself. Um, but um, he, he was able to talk to me about it. Another time he got injured at work and he started having a lot of back pain. So he took extra doses of his medicine and he ran out early. And so what I had him do, which we'll talk about more when we do the pain section, um, is I had him, I reminded him that, uh, that he could always call me for that. And I do sometimes prescribe a higher dose of buprenorphine for a week to treat acute, acute pain. And he expressed appreciation and gratitude at the opportunity for treatment and the ability to function without continuing to use heroin. And so this is really what treatment looks like. You know, patients are going to come in and say their, their medicine's stolen, their medicine's lost. You know, they're using, they used another drug at a party. They um, had some pain and they took extra uh, medication. So just know that patient can be doing well in treatment and all these things um, probably will still happen. So with that, I'm going to stop because I, again, talk too much. And I'm going to let Dr. Morrow do a short section on um, stigma. And then I will finish up with a section on pain. Okay, great. So I will get this sharing properly. Okay. All right. So this section will be talking about stigma a little bit. Uh, so first of all, just, just a little bit on, on terminology. We use um, the, the phrase medication-assisted treatment uh, has been replaced by the, by the Society of Addiction Medicine. Uh, now that MAT refers to medications for addiction treatment. Um, and but we'll be using the MOUD uh, acronym medications for opioid use disorder. That uh, name change was due to both stigma and accuracy of the of the name. So that that's what we call this now is medications for opioid use disorder. Um, so this section is kind of arranged around uh, myths about. Uh, these medications for opioid use disorder, that's mainly buprenorphine and also methadone. Uh, so one that you'll hear a lot is that um, you're just trading one addiction for another by using uh, buprenorphine or methadone. Um, but uh, the reality is that this this type of treatment is it's a it's a bridge. It acts as a bridge between the biological and behavioral components of addiction. Um, addiction is it's an illness, and so it's we're, we're treating that as an illness. Um, and research indicates that a combination of medication and behavioral therapies can successfully treat these uh, substance use disorders. Um, So if you think about it, there's other treatments that we use for addiction and people don't seem to have the same sorts of attitudes towards them, right? So Nicorette gum, uh, lozenges, patches, um, that, that's the same approach as methadone. Uh, for, I mean, it's literally the same approach. Uh, just for a different disorder. And, and by the way, there's uh, varenicline or Chantix that's the same approach, it's a partial agonist. That's the same approach as, as with buprenorphine. I mean, it's just pharmacologically the exact same thing. So um, it's, a, it's a treatment. And what I, what I would look at is more 
how has the patient's life changed as a result of taking this drug? Is it worse? Are they, you know, is their whole life revolving around this drug? Are they losing their job? Are they losing? That's addiction. If they're able to work, if taking care of their kids, if all of these things are improving, uh, that's treatment for addiction. That's getting better. Um, so to at least, you know, for me, I don't really care if somebody's using a drug or not using it. That, that's not the point. That's not what addiction is. That's not, the, 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 the point is how is their life being affected by this? Um, and we have across the board, these medications improve every outcome you can think of in terms of addiction. So um, very, very effective interventions. That's the reality. Um, so another concern that people have uh, is diversion. And I guess the myth here would be that everybody is, is diverting these drugs, these you know, buprenorphine and other things. Um, the reality is that people do divert uh, buprenorphine, meaning they misuse uh, buprenorphine. We'll talk about what the, what the definition of misuse is. But they misuse buprenorphine on this graph. It's about 20, 27%, 28% of, of people prescribed it will misuse it in one way or another. Um, that's not different from uh, other medications that people, basically any prescription that you give somebody will be misuse. Maybe I just target. So misuse means taking a drug, that's a, prescri a prescribed drug, in a way that it has not been prescribed, taking more of it or less of it, taking it more frequently, taking it via different route of administration, taking it when it's not prescribed to you, but to somebody else, that's misuse. Um, people do that with pain medications, they do that with antibiotics, they do it with basically anything we prescribe. And buprenorphine is certainly not an exception to that. But, you know, these it's 28% that tells you that the majority of people, a clear majority, do not misuse their buprenorphine. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, so here are some facts about misuse of buprenorphine. Um, buprenorphine can cause euphoria in non-opioid dependent individuals. That is very, that is definitely true. It can cause people to get high. It's, it's an opioid. So you can get some, it's not going to get as much of a high as you would with a full agonist, but you can get high from buprenorphine. If you're already dependent on opioids, as we talked about, you're going to have a lot of tolerance to that. And you're not going to get a lot of euphoria out of buprenorphine, um, but otherwise you can. Um, it does have misuse potential, but less so than full opioid agonists. It's less rewarding. It's a very long acting drug that doesn't support addictive behavior very well. Um, so less uh, abuse potential. Um, and most of the illicit use is to prevent withdrawal cravings. It's a self-treatment for an opioid addiction. That's what they're using it for. It's not as a primary drug of, of abuse in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, at least in this country, it's, it's just not used that way. Yeah, if you want to abuse drugs, just get fentanyl. It's cheaper, easier. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, it's not it's not used in that way. Um, there's a combination product. Uh, Suboxone is one of these we talked about. Where it's combined with naloxone. Uh, theoretically, that's less likely to be misused than the than just buprenorphine alone. Um, Practically, it doesn't really make that much of a difference in terms of the high that you would get. The naloxone is not going to, it's not going to completely block the high that you would get from buprenorphine. It delays it a little bit. Um, but buprenorphine is actually a, it has a higher binding affinity, affinity than, than naloxone. So it's not going to, it's not going to completely block that. Um, but if you're concerned about misuse, Yes, you can prescribe the combination product uh, rather than the mono product. Um, so, but this is this is a main point here is is why people are using or misusing buprenorphine. Um, so, 
if the if it's so people give these reasons because it gives me a better high than other prescription opioids or it was my drug of choice to get high with um very low percentages of people will say that um and and part of this is just not true i mean it's just it's not a better high than other opioids so so most the vast majority of people that's not why they're using buprenorphine most of them it's to maintain my abstinence from other drugs because I was trying to wean off of drugs on my own. That's why they're using it. It's, it's basically because they don't have access to a legitimate source of buprenorphine. Um, that's why it's being misused. That's the vast majority of this misuse. Um, so it gets categorized that way, but it's really different from uh, some of the other types of misuse that people are really uh, worried about, an, an addictive type of misuse. Um, and if we look at uh, treatment for we, we don't know, for substance use, uh, it's, it's hard to get data on just what people are doing in general, but you can get treatment episodes and you can see uh, for 2019, um, this is admissions for where alcohol was the primary drug uh, uh, used or marijuana. Buprenorphine is on this list. We have people getting treatment for buprenorphine. This is in the state of Michigan. Uh, and it was 13 people in 2019. Not 13% of admissions, 13 people total <laughs> treated for bu buprenorphine addiction. It is addictive, but it's really not a major problem. Okay, so... Uh, Another thing to address here is that uh, medications for opioid use disorder uh, reduce the risk of opioid-related overdose uh, pretty dramatically, actually, but it reduces it by about half. Um, but it's also important to remember that even, at, even a, if you have gone through a, a detox and you use opioids after that, uh, even one use can lead to it. That can be a fatal overdose because you now the, the tolerance is not there, and even the same dose that you used to use before, that will be fatal because you've lost the tolerance. So it's important to recognize that detoxification alone, without any kind, I mean that's just not an adequate treatment. In fact, you're putting the person at, at very high risk of a fatal overdose if, if that's all you're doing. And it's also important to discuss with patients if they stop using their buprenorphine, if they stop using whatever it is, uh, medication that they're using for opioid use disorder, and then use, that's a, that puts them at very high risk for, for a fatal overdose. Okay, so stigma. Um, and part of this refers to the language that we're talking about, but uh, so stigma is, uh, it's a mark of shame or discredit. That's the origin of the words. The stigma. It's a. It's a. Um, it's a mark of humiliation, lack of respect. This is this is what this is. Um, so it's causing shame, a painful feeling of humiliation, distress, by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior, um, and discrediting a loss of reputation or respect. This is this comes from a mindset of blaming the person for their addiction, uh, as if it's a, a, a moral problem or something like that. Really at odds with our current scientific understanding of what addiction is. And people with addiction will face stigma from lots of different uh, places, from um, public in general, uh, from the recovery community. Uh, for example, people talking about you're not really, uh, if you're not in abstinence, uh, you're, not, you're not abstinent if you're taking med medications for opioid use disorder, that can be a source of stigma. Um, the patients can internalize that stigma and stigmatize themselves. They'll talk about themselves in very dis disparaging terms. Um, and they get stigma from their clinical providers. Um, for example, if they'll have a belief that, that there is no treatment for addiction, it's hopeless, and all of this kind of thing. These, these, are, these are stigmatizing beliefs. It's not accurate, it's just a stigma. Um, 
And this last one, the, the healthcare providers, this is the most commonly cited source of stigma for patients. Uh, people who are treating them for their substance use disorder, that's the most likely source of stigma to them, the exact opposite of what it should be. Um, substance use is more stigmatized than any physical or mental illness. Uh, and it's worst among people with a lot of experience. These seasoned clinicians will see uh, these uh, substance use patients as unimportant, poorly motivated, manipulative, violent. That leads to lower empathy, lower provider involvement, shorter visits, lower patient engagement and retention. So it's important to recognize that as a problem and try to recognize that in yourself and your colleagues, because this is a major barrier to, to, to treatment that people face. Um, so one way to, to, to address this is, is just the language that we're using. So I've got some things listed here, addict, alcoholic, junkie. Um, these are not terms that we should be using uh, in a, certainly in a clinical setting or really otherwise. Uh, the preferred language is a person with a substance use disorder, with an opioid use disorder. Um, that puts the, the, that centers the, they're a person. You're not defining them in terms of their illness, right? I'm not a hangnail. I'm a person with a hangnail, right? Uh, so you can, uh, and when talking about uh, drug results, clean, dirty, these are stigmatizing languages. So, so much better as expected or unexpected results. Um, so I have some other ones listed there, but. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that uh, treatment with opioid, treatment of opioid use disorders will reduce the harms of, of ongoing opioid uh, use. Um, so you can, uh, even if they're continuing to use, you can help them do that in a, in a safer way and improve outcomes. Um, access to sterile injection equipment, um, educating people on overdoses, distributing naloxone to people, um, all of these things help to reduce the, the or, or improve outcomes with people with substance use disorders, even if they're not, not able or willing to stop what they're doing. Um, and just, we can compare substance use disorders to other chronic illnesses. It, it's very heritable. There's about 60%, 56% of the, the risk there is genetic. Uh, it's also influenced by environment and behavior in response to appropriate treatment. Um, but without adequate treatment, you get a lot of morbidity and mortality. Um, we have excellent treatments for opioid use disorder. They should be offered to people and they should get access to it. Um, it has a biological basis um, and you get recurrences, you get relapses. That's not uncommon with chronic illnesses. Um, like diabetes, which is a chronic illness. Um, so just think about it. if you had a patient with diabetes who didn't take their medications or adhere to their diet, didn't get their labs done, didn't go to the, to the nutritionist or something like that. Are you gonna tell them it's your fault that you have uncontrolled diabetes? Are you gonna deny them medication uh, until they go to their nutritionist? Are you gonna withhold their medication if they ran out early? Take them out of their office if they have hyperglycemia. Probably not, right? So, so why would we treat an addiction patient like this? Why would we treat somebody with a substance use disorder like this? So ways to challenge addiction, be open um, to the latest research, be open to new ways of thinking about it. Uh, speak out if you're seeing stigma, if you're seeing discrimination, uh, call that out. Uh, call that out to your colleagues. Hopefully they'll be appreciative of that <laughs> uh, if, you, if you do it in a, in a collegial way. If you're, especially if you're giving them, um, giving them tools to interact with people better and make their life easier. So it's ultimately what you're gonna do. They'll, they'll be, they should be open to that. Um, be mindful of your own language. Um, and just in general, just treat people with dignity and respect um, and give access to evidence-based treatment. So there's an, an example of treat with dignity and respect. So my was asking me about, um, um, 
if they should have the because they had patients trying to um, get around the urine drug screens. Should I have people uh, when they come into my office put on a hospital gown, take off all their clothes, their underwear, and get into the hospital gown before doing the urine drug screen, which I'll observe in the office? Probably not. <laughs> right? That seems like a barrier. That seems stigmatizing, and 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 it's a it's a loss of dignity. What are you gaining by that? I think you're losing a lot more by putting all these restrictions on than uh, than you would if you just did the urine drug screen and had some people get around it. Sometimes, you know, as, as we talked about, it's a tool. It's not we're not it's not forensics here. Um, so. Actually, I think that, I think we'll stop there because we need to go to the pain section. But uh, any any questions about this? While we switch over, thanks, Dr. Morrow. Okay, um, we had such great questions. So usually we do them at the end. I'm not sure how much time we'll have at the end for questions, but please keep them coming. Um, this is a short section on pain management. I tried to think of it in terms of acute, chronic, and perioperative pain management for patients with and sometimes without opioid use disorder. So we know that patients with opioid use disorder have increased pain sensitivity. They've done studies on patients who are on opioid agonist treatment, which is buprenorphine or methadone, and they have less pain tolerance than match controls. Um, either peer groups in remission or siblings without an addiction history. Um, that, that, yeah, okay. Um, so what if you have your patient on buprenorphine or methadone and they come in and they're having some sort of acute pain need? Um, like they've, you know, thrown out their back or uh, back or they have some broken bone. So patients who are physically dependent on opioids, and again, this could be a patient who's on buprenorphine, who's getting a prescription for oxycodone, or a patient who's using them on the street, you know, um, they must be maintained on their daily equivalence of an opioid before they have any analgesic effect from opioids. What does that mean? So if I have a patient that receives Suboxone 16-4 milligrams a day, um, they need to take suboxone 16-4 milligrams per day. Um, if I want to treat their pain, I will have to use more opioids on top of that, in addition to that, um, before they'll receive any pain treatment. So that could either look like, um, you know, giving them a bit extra buprenorphine for a week or it could look like giving them an oxy, a couple of tabs of oxycodone that they take in addition to their suboxone. Patients also are theorized to have um, higher, or they, they have higher opioid analgesic requirements due to this increased pain sensitivity and opioid cross tolerance. Um, so what do we do if, you know, if they come in and they're having some pain? So obviously, in, with all pain management, we want to start with non-opioid analgesics, non-pharmacologic management. So, you know, um, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, duloxetine, amitriptyline, um, physical therapy, any referral for injections. Um, but if opiates are needed for a patient, who has opioid use disorder and they're on buprenorphine, I usually use the rule of thumb that I dose about 1.5 times the amount I would use for someone who does not have an opioid use disorder. And we always continue their baseline dose of buprenorphine. So what does that mean if, if the patient is getting discharged from the ER and the doc calls you and they say like, I usually prescribe people with this condition five milligrams of oxycodone three times a day for three days. Then for my patient, I would suggest that they prescribe 7.5 milligrams of oxycodone um, three times a day for three days, and then they follow up with me. 
And again, I've mentioned this before, but we want to try and use split dosing, either TID or QID, ideally, because the analgesic effect of buprenorphine is six to eight hours. And, you know, I have patients that come in and they've thrown out their back or they've twisted their ankle really badly, or they're having some dental work. Um, and I sometimes just increase their buprenorphine dose uh, um, for a week, and then I reassess them. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be 25%, although maybe that's a good that's a good rule of thumb. But you know, whatever whatever they're dosing, whatever's convenient. So, um, so if they're you know getting two films a day and that's 16 milligrams, maybe I'll give them an extra half film a day. Maybe I'll give them an extra film depending on how much pain they're in and what what's going on. What about when patients who are taking buprenorphine go for a procedure. Um, so, you know, the literature had been mixed on this, and I think we're moving more towards a consensus that we do not discontinue their buprenorphine. Um, it just seems that patients who have their buprenorphine discontinued prior the, to the procedure do poorly for a variety of different reasons, one being that they experience more pain. And this is a really great. Um, algorithm from Rewrite the Script for how to manage perioperative buprenorphine. I will say though here, if we if we go to the column um, on the right surgery with moderate to severe pain, buprenorphine dose greater than eight milligrams, yes. Buprenorphine daily dose greater than 16 milligrams, yes. Cut the buprenorphine um, to 16 milligrams to be taken the day prior to surgery. Sometimes my patients can't even manage that. Um, if they're on 24 milligrams, you know, the day before surgery, they're they're very anxious. If they're having whatever they're, you know, is causing them to have surgeries, putting them into a lot of pain, they just can't manage that. So if you can't cut down the buprenorphine dose before the surgery, I think that's okay too. I just have them take eight mil, the one film in the morning. Um, and I I often will touch base with the surgeon to work together in the um pre-surgical buprenorphine management and the post-surgical pain management. So I know that was very brief, I'm sorry, but now we're gonna move into chronic pain. So what are some steps for approaching chronic pain? If we take a step back, we wanna identify and treat any local pain generators, find and treat comorbid psychiatric illness. Often, if that is not treated um, um, often, not always, but the, the patient's pain won't really improve. Um, you need to really treat, you know, the addiction and the comorbid psychiatric illness together um, for the pain to improve. I wonder if Dr. Morrow would say that all three kind of go together too. Maybe you have to treat the pain too for, for the other things to, to improve, but we can't just find one problem and treat it in isolation. Really, we have to work on everything together. We want to understand the continuum from pain to opioid use disorder. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's, there is a continuum and it's interesting along, the more you get to know the patients, you can kind of see if they fall more in terms of a dependence. And they're really, I would say what really distinguishes that for me is how much control they have over their use. Um, and sometimes you, you know, a patient will come in and they, they're presenting as chronic pain and then, you know, history will come out, you know, oh, but I also used illicit heroin, I was injecting it, but I stopped doing that five years ago. You know, well, okay, now I now I think, now that patient definitely has an opioid use disorder, but they're presenting as a patient who has chronic pain. And often again, as we know, this, this sort of history just comes out and it takes time. Restore sleep and promote increased physical activity and decreased fear of movement. That's really important actually in treating pain. Um, not, not always, not with all conditions, but with many conditions, really the patient has to incorporate some physical activity into their routine um, before we really see improvement in their pain. I'm not really gonna go over this, but you know, uh, we know that now when a patient has chronic pain, we wanna try and avoid opioid therapy for as long as possible. If they're, if they're already receiving opiate therapy, we do not taper or just abruptly discontinue. We have to develop a personalized plan for each patient. And then if they have acute pain, we want to, if we, if we do feel like opioid therapy is indicated, we want to use um, as, as um, little, as small as a dose, as short as duration as possible. 
So, um, okay. So this, this comes up a lot. When do I consider transitioning my patient who's getting a prescribed full opioid agonist to buprenorphine? So you have a patient that comes to you and they are receiving a prescription for oxycodone. Which in your patient panel, which, which of those patients would you, would you want to suggest that they transition to buprenorphine? So really, if the patient isn't doing well, if it's stressful for if you know you see them on your schedule and you feel stressed, that's that should be a marker for you that maybe you should start thinking about buprenorphine or at least explore it with your patient. You know, sometimes patient has um, a benefit from the opioid dose, but it's intermittent. You know, and they're telling you like, I take my oxycodone, I can get, I can get something done for a few hours, but then I just sit around and I wait for my next dose. That patient might do better on buprenorphine. It's long acting. You know, if the patient just needs more and more opioids or they're, they're um, having a lot of adverse effects from the opioids, um, if, they're, if they're, you know, really asking for more and more, or if they have some sort of other severe substance use disorder going on. Dr. Sethi? Yeah, is there a question? Quick question. Quick question, yep. How do you explain to an expecting parent that has decided to stop MAT due to being pregnant and worried about the baby? I think the focus should be on explaining the continued benefits especially through the delivery? Well, that is a great question. And we don't have to have time for a section on pregnancy in this, um, which is which is really important. But we, as a medical professional, we don't ever recommend that a pregnant person stop their um, MAT for, for many reasons. Number one, risk to mom, you know, risk of overdose, um, but also if, if the patient stops, um, if the patient has an opioid dependence and they stop it, they're at very high risk for a miscarriage. So really whenever I, um, as part of you know, the informed consent, if the patient is able to have children, if they're of reproductive age, um, I, I tell them, you know, if, if you get pregnant and you are on this buprenorphine, I will strongly recommend that you continue it because if you stop it, if you, you know, if we decrease your dose, I will, I will be very worried about your health and your baby's health. Um, so I, I don't, I, I yeah. Um, but, but, you know, if uh, whoever asked this question wants to contact me afterwards, um, I, I would be happy to talk to them more about it. And can this be referred to protective services? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can certainly look into it and find out, but no, I mean, really, um, I stress even before the patient starts with buprenorphine that if there is the event of a pregnancy, we we really we never recommend that um, anyone stop their buprenorphine during pregnancy. Okay, so if we found a patient um, in our panel getting prescribed opioids, but they're not they they're, they're not very functional. Um, and they feel like they need a higher dose or they run out of their prescription early. Um, you want to start talking to them about how buprenorphine might be a better regimen for them and might give them more relief and more functional benefits in terms of chronic pain. Um, and, you know, this is often not a one-time conversation unless it's more pressing for whatever reason, but buprenorphine is an FDA-approved medication for pain, and so really trying to talk to your patients. And we can pull in all these reasons. You know, if they're using other drugs, there's lower risk for overdose, there's less side effects, um, there's less tolerance. So if you have a patient who really needs a dose increase on their full agonist opioids every couple of months, um, buprenorphine is a great suggestion there. If they're having some benefit from opioids, but it's intermittent, buprenorphine is long acting. Um, but there are some, you know, insurance concerns. Um, and if you are having a page, if you want to talk to us more about how to switch someone from opioids, whatever opioid they're on, onto a pain um, formulation for buprenorphine, you can always contact us. Um, if someone is on prescribed fentanyl and methadone, you can bridge them with short acting opioids. So you can stop their fentanyl and methadone and put them on you know, oxycodone for five days and then put them on buprenorphine and that will decrease their risk of a precipitated acute withdrawal. But we can unfortunately not do that for our patients who are buying opioids on the street because that is illegal. So that is an option if someone is being prescribed fentanyl or methadone though. And if you have more questions about that, please contact us. 
Um, okay. So there are two FDA approved formulations for pain, two, two of the two main ones. Um, there's transdermal buprenorphine, but, which, uh, which is butrans, which also comes in a generic. But if someone is more taking more than 80 oral morphine equivalents a day, it's rarely effective for them. But, you know, it's really easy to start. So if you have someone on oxycodone, you just start it. And during the first day, you taper them off um, any other opioid that you're prescribing. You want to wait a week to titrate the dose. You can cut the patches, um, but oftentimes they're not covered by insurance. And here's, um, you know, again, you'll get these slides, but here's a table that we would use to suggest where you would start them in terms of the transdermal buprenorphine dose. Um, in terms of another FDA-approved medication for pain that we can prescribe in the outpatient setting, um, there's a, a buccal buprenorphine product, and that's the brand name is Belbuca, and it's unfortunately brand only. So this can also be a pain to have covered and to do prior authorization most of the time. This is really adequate for patients who are on more than 150 milligrams of the oral morphine equivalents. And so usually, um, if I can, I start with the oral butrans patch. And if that doesn't work, then we'll transition them to the, the, uh, the, the buccal buprenorphine. And again, there's no really induction protocol. We just start it and we taper them off any other opioid after a day. You can cut these. And many, you know, this is FDA approved to be B BID dosing, but many patients prefer the TID dosing. And so really that's, that's I, I sometimes start with BID, but I, I, I end up with most of my patients on TID dosing. The max dose for this is 900 micrograms BID. And as you can see, you know, the, oops, these, the transdermal buprenorphine is in micrograms here, and the suboxone is in milligrams. So the doses for the pain um, are, are much lower, although some of that is due to the bioavailability. But I, I would worry less about, you know, the dose and, and really try and focus on clinically um, how much, how more, if the patient's more functional um, in terms of pain and pain management on these medications. So what happens when, you know, we have them on a higher dose of this, you know, they, they fail the transdermal buprenorphine, doesn't help them at all. We try them on the buccal buprenorphine, it's not helping at all. So what, what do we do next? I, I say that I think that's a good time to sort of um, reset, try and obtain more history of what the patient thinks isn't working or, or what they're finding that they, they don't like about this versus their prior pain regimen. Um, if, if, you know, they're doing uh, the buckle dosing, again, I just think it's always worth it to review. I went over this before, but just review the dosing for buckle or sub, sublingual medications. I'm often surprised patients who've been on these medicines for years really have, I don't remember how to take it and are doing, um, they tell me that they do really um just the things with their medication that make me laugh. So I always think it's worth it to review that and make sure that they're actually, you know, absorbing the medication. But then I also, I have this slide here just to say like, maybe this is a patient that's presenting with pain, but we need to go back to they, do they have an opioid use disorder? You know, um, I, I, I have this, I like to keep this handy and show this to the patient. Like, this is this is the cri medical criteria for addiction. You know, it's not we don't have on here how much you're using or how often you're using. We have these kinds of things. You know, um, you know, m minus tolerance and withdrawal because we pre we're prescribing these patients medications. But do you feel like do you feel like these kinds of things are affecting your daily life? Then maybe we need to go back and think about this patient in terms of an opioid use disorder. And then at that case, we would be using buprenorphine, naloxone or suboxone. And it, it, that's off label for pain, but it is, you know, if the patient has a coexisting chronic pain and opioid use disorder, then we can certainly prescribe it. There's no expert consensus on how formulations for um, the buprenorphine indicated for pain compared to buprenorphine naloxone in terms of the serum levels. Um, and insurance might not cover it for non-opioid use disorder diagnosis. So again, I go over this with the patient. Many, many of the 
patients I see with chronic pain, although I'm an addiction doctor, so my, my patient panel is probably skewed, but many of them do come in and, you know, they, they, they will have cravings and use in larger amount, and that's a mild opioid use disorder. Um, so, you know, then, then they have an opioid use disorder and they have, um, chronic pain. And so I can just, um, bill this as treatment for their opioid use disorder and it is covered. Um, here is a suggestion, you know, if they have been prescribed um, oral morphine equivalents, you can start them with these doses of buprenorphine. But again, you know, if you feel like your patient has an opioid use disorder, they're probably going to be more in that 16 milligram, 12, you know, a 16 milligram range that Dr. Morrow mentioned earlier. Um, but I do, do think it's important to stress to these patients that you try and take it multiple times a day. Everybody is different. I've had patients who have terrible chronic pain who really like taking it twice a day. Um, but again, just try and get them on some sort of regimen. Do we have a question? How much do you include immediate support persons in education of SUD or do you refer to support groups? I think, you know, oh, and this presentation has been helpful. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, in terms of the immediate support, persons, I think it's difficult to answer that without knowing more about your practice setting. You know, some of us work in opioid health homes and are really um, incredibly fortunate to be working with a peer support person. Um, others work with um, counselors who are available to educate the patients. Others of us have nurses or LPNs who are very involved and can educate the patient. So I really think that depends on how much support you have. But again, I always encourage the patient to do counseling and the support groups I think are very, very helpful if for nothing else to feel less alone and to meet people who have similar goals. So here's a case. This is a 72 year old with a post polio syn syn syndrome, OSA on CPAP, multi-level spinal fusion. He came in to an office in Ann Arbor after having moved from the UP, he moved to live with his daughter. He had been prescribed opioids for 30 to 40 years. Most recently, hydrocodone APAP 10-325 milligram, two pills TID, but it wasn't working and he felt like he needed more. He was also on diazepam 2.5 milligrams at night for insomnia. Um, he had been dis on disability for several years and there was a lot of stress in his home because his daughter was going through a divorce. Um, so he was referred to the Ann Arbor Back and Spine Clinic and received a PMR injection, with which really helped him. Or I guess he was referred to PMR. I'm not sure, actually. But he got some sort of injection in his back. It helped him a lot. He also then was able to go to PT. Um, we were able to taper his diazepam, and he, he didn't miss it. He was able to maintain his sleep. Um, he was originally started on buccal buprenorphine, 150 micrograms BID, which was then increased to 300 BID. It worked well, but then insurance stopped covering it. So he was transitioned to buprenorphine naloxone, two milligrams sublingual TID for off-label treatment of pain. He was thinking about volunteering for voters, not politicians. So um, do we have another question? No, thank you. You're welcome. Just a really brief word on naltrexone in pain treatment. This is, I think, more complicated than buprenorphine in pain treatment. So if you have anyone who you would like to talk to us about, please contact us. Um, but then, you know, especially with this extended release naltrexone, the and the um it sort of it it tapers off at about 14 days of the 28 day uh, tw quote unquote 28 day course. So usually I try and if it's, it's if, a, if it's a, you know, scheduled procedure, we try and schedule it to line up with about the day 28 of their naltrexone um, injection. Um, but if patient has a more acute need, it can be very tricky because the analgesic effect of opioids are blocked at conventional doses. So you, they need six to 20 times the analgesic dose. Um, and, and usually they can receive that without significant respiratory depression or sedation. But obviously, you know, if there's, you know, a, you know, an urgent or acute procedure or surgery, um, you need to have anesthesia nearby um, and always, always uh, non-opioids and regional anesthesia for these patients. Um, 
but yeah, I, this these this is tricky. I I had a patient who needed a sinus surgery and she was doing really well. She was a single mom and um we started her, you know, we held her extended release naltrexone for a week and put her on oral naltrexone and this was during the time of the pandemic. So her, her procedure got pushed and she ended up um, returning to use. And it was just really sad. So I think just a lot of education with these patients too, if there's, a, especially if you have, to, if you have the luxury of time and you know when their surgery is scheduled, just trying to talk to them about how they're going to manage in that window um, where they're not going to be re receiving the extended release naltrexone is important. But again, you can always contact us to, um, talk through individual cases. So let's see. Oh, I finished with three minutes to spare. And here's some pain. We'll send out these slides, but here's some good pain management resources. And we also have a website, Michigan Opioid Collaborative. Oh, Megan put it in the chat. So yeah, we have a lot of resources there. We have a few minutes. I'm happy to stay on if there's any questions. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and try and cut down the slides a little more. I wish we did have more questions at the end time for questions at the end, but thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you all so much for um, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Sethi and Dr. Morrow for your time as well. Um, we will hang out for just a minute. So if there are other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat um, or your behavioral health consultant um, will be um, getting a hold of you within the next few days, most likely with um, the slide deck for today. Um, and they're also able to help navigate any other questions that you might have, or if you'd like to um, join us um, as our as a um, to have us use as a consultant, um, we can um, walk you through that process of how to get started. Um, if you were to have patient questions down the line, to connect with one of our addiction um, specialist doctors that are on our team. Um, we are um, sending out an email as well with the CME information. The link does end, um, I believe it's 48 hours. So you should get that here shortly um, from us. And um, please click the links. If you have any trouble with those links, um, then feel free to email um, email us back and let us know. We can help walk, walk you through that, why it may not be um, working. Sometimes we have glitches, um, but that should be coming out shortly. So look, maybe, you know, by the time you get back from lunch, hopefully you should have that in your inbox. Um, again, thank you so much. We offer these trainings um, quarterly throughout the year. Um, and so if you found it helpful today and think a colleague or a friend or a neighbor or someone else in your community, or maybe a community leader could um, benefit from learning this information as well, please send them along and let us know. Um, let us know that they that they're interested. We can make sure they get on our email list or um, simply send them to our website. Um, so with that, we've got a, a minute left technically, but we'll like I said, we'll stay on and hang out. Um, here's a question, um, Dr. Morrow and Dr. Sethi. If patients are started on buprenorphine in the hospital but need a provider to continue as outpatient, is MOC able to help um, providers? Yes, I can answer that. Um, you would contact us here at MOC. Um, and your local behavioral health consultant has lots of community resources, lots of connections that can be made, and we would be happy um, to connect those um, patients, um, either the provider from the ER or the patient directly um, through you to find more resources, Stacey. So thank you so much for asking that. Yes, um, we would love to hear from you if that, if that happens. Um, so yeah, so thank you. It is noon. Um, so we'll be respectful of your time. Feel free to go ahead and sign off um, if you'd like, but otherwise, um, happy Monday. Um, and we'll hopefully see you again at a next webinar or event. Shiva, did you see um, you had a direct Mess, it looked like a direct message question, perhaps. I'm sorry. I did not see it. Oh, here we go. Okay. It's about a patient who tapered off so on Sunday. Um, I am happy to answer your question. Would you like to um would would you like to tell us more about the patient right now? Or would you rather we do it at another time in a more private setting. What would be better for you? Can I email you? Sure. I'll put my email into the chat.
Yeah, no problem. I look forward to hearing from you. Great. Well, thank you, Shiva, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Megan.